Actually, they're going to just keep it as four just now. Yeah. Hmm. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome back from lunch. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch and you've had a good day so far. I welcome you all to the transitioning to clean energy together. And for this session, we have as a guest of honor today, His Excellency, Mr. Lars Agard, Minister for Climate Energy and Utilities, Ministry of Energy, Utilities and Climate, Denmark, and I'd like to invite you on stage, sir. <laughs> and to give the Danish perspectives, I'd like to invite Mr. Henrik Steisdal, Founder, Chief Technical Officer, and Board Member Steisdal to join us, please. To give the Indian perspectives, may I invite Dr. Ajay Mathur, Director General, International Solar Alliance India, to join us on stage. Okay, I'm told he'll just be joining us. And to chair the session and moderate the session, I'd like to invite Mr. Mr. Ms. Gitte Lille Lund Beck former Minister of Defense, Denmark, to come and take the session forward. Over to you, ma'am. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Your Excellences, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As you heard, my name is Gide Lillelund Beck. I'm from the Chamber of Commerce. And I have the pleasure to guide us through the session uh, this afternoon, the next one hour. And why is this session so important? And why am I so proud to actually to be here and to be the moderator of this session? It is because we have some speakers with highly relevant experiences, insights into transition into green energy. And the importance of transition to renewable energy can't be underestimated. I think we discussed this this morning uh, and we are going to discuss it also in this session. We all know that renewable energy is the cheapest and fastest method to create energy in a world where energy demand will continue to grow. It goes hand in hand with growth, and therefore it's very central that we look into the renewable energy and not just the fossil energy that we have been used to. When we're going to have the green transition, India's importance is crucial. Not only as it, is, it will soon be the most populated country on Earth, but especially because in India, what we see here is actually innovation and production capacity. Since the energy crisis in 1970s, Denmark has focused on renewable energy sources, particularly in, on wind energy. And we can say, at least in Denmark, uh, we've been very good at wind energy because it's a very cold country and it's, the wind is blowing all the time. But 
It also showed us that we can actually work with renewables. So now it's not only uh, uh, wind energy that we work with in Denmark, it's also... but also a new interaction with energy customers. Digitalization is a huge part of the solution. Um, in Denmark, as well as, uh, as in India, we look at how we can expand our electricity markets to neighboring countries. Energy efficiency is, of course, a keystone in whatever we do. Um, and India as well as Denmark, need to move forward on energy efficiency. Just look at the numbers of the future energy demand of the, the Indian society. It's, uh, it's amazing. Um, indirect electrification through a green hydrogen uh, system is also of common interest uh, and an area where we in the future must deepen and, and develop further on our cooperation. And of course, underneath all of this, we share the ambition of a green future where we will meet our uh, climate targets, secure prosperity for our population while recognizing the security aspects linked to any nation's energy supply and independence. Isn't it simply fantastic that we live in a time where we share the same goals, of course in different proportions, we are looking for some of the same technologies, regulatory and practic solutions. We have so much to share. Collaboration is, of course, part of the answer, but for me personally, it's, uh, it's fantastic to live in a period where the challenges are so commonly shared globally, which, of course, helps industry to invest, to develop, to create new products, that would be needed for all citizens on this planet. It's stated many times that uh, India has the scale and Denmark has the skill. Um, the challenge now is to scale. Um, and from the Danish side and from the Indian side, in order to do this, um, we must work closely together. India has established the Green Hydrogen Mission to become a global driver on the production, usage and export of green hydrogen. I salute that. Denmark has also an ambition to be a frontrunner in the hydrogen sector. We need the indirect electrification linked to the green hydrogen economy. 
Uh, so there we also share both common goals, but I also think that we can move further and move faster by working together. Uh, I also wish to uh, commend the upcoming Indian Centre on Offshore Wind. Uh, it's a huge project. As I've been informed, it's the first 4 gigawatt offshore wind that will be installed in India. I'm very proud that Denmark has been a partner in preparing the tender, um, and I expect much more will follow. As a Minister of Climate, Energy and Utilities, I'm proud to see how many Danish companies are investing, producing and innovating in India, and how the Indian partners are contributing, contributing with great skills. We have created a true and solid alliance together that we can build upon. I hope that we can support the long-term energy planning goals of India, the ambition to raise 450 gigawatts of renewable energy in 2030, 450 gigawatts, amazing. And as you see today, Danish companies stand ready to assist in every way. Thank you for hosting us in your beautiful country. I'm looking forward to deepening the successful relations for the decades to come and for all the things we must achieve together. It's time to scale. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. And the next speaker is a Danish entrepreneur who had the curiosity and the courage to make a difference. Uh, I'm very proud to introduce to you Mr. Henrik Stiesdale. He's the father of the modern wind turbine. And last night at the reception, Mr. Stiesdale also told me that he had so many ideas when he was at university, so he didn't finalize the final thesis on university. But I can also tell you, he told me yesterday, he's a very good skier. So if you can go skiing in India, I don't know. But now, at least, I would like to introduce to you, Mr. Stiesdale, the floor is yours. Yes, becoming a ski instructor was not easy, I just want to say. Uh, excellences, ministers, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be able to share with you a vision for uh, the next step in the global energy transition. Let's see if we, this one here works. It does, kind of. Next slide, please. Yeah, there we are. It all started 50 years ago with the, when the Arab countries cut off all, all supplies to countries that have supported Israel. The effects were what became known as the oil crisis. Uh, we had shortages all over the world. In Denmark, we had car-free Sundays. From one day to the next, um, the world realized the value of energy security. Imported oil was not a long-term solution. It should be replaced by domestic resources. Next, please. In Denmark, we had, by then, a long tradition for wind power. The first electricity production in 1890, the first grid-connected turbine anywhere in the world in 1927, the most successful large wind turbine in 1957. That was a good starting point. Um, Pioneer started around 1975. Next, please. And <clears throat> next, please. It's maybe it's me. Ah, there we are. Um, we developed the, what became known as the Danish concept. And from around 1980, we had a genuine wind industry. Next, please. Um, where the wind turbines have found the shape we know today. So already then we knew what to do. Next, please. And big projects in California from 1983 onwards gave the industry the mass production benefit, the volumes it took to make wind power really competitive. Next slide, please. And therefore, it was no surprise, no coincidence, that when India launched its first large wind power program in 1986, it turned to Denmark for the machines. The first three wind farms in Asia were installed in Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Tamil Nadu, all using Danish turbines. These early projects paved the way not only for 
wind power collaboration, but also for collaboration on other types of renewable energy, on energy efficiency, and so on. Next, please. In 1991, we took the first step offshore in order to be prepared when land became a short uh, resource onshore. And now uh, the EU expects that by 2050, 50% of all electricity will come from offshore wind. Next, please. <clears throat> and therefore, it is uh, no coincidence that it is together with Denmark that India has prepared its plans for, um, for offshore wind energy. And we hope, as uh, Lars Ogo already mentioned, to see a tender come out shortly. The original motivation for wind power was energy security. But we know all now that that is not what it is only about nowadays. It's about averting climate disaster. And there we do have the factor that uh, no single technology does the job. Not wind power, not solar, no single technology does the job. Therefore, we need more technologies than wind power. The good news is that we already have them. They are all available. We just need to combine them in an efficient way. Next, please. This is a picture of how a modern energy system could look. Um, it is based on three resources, wind, solar power, and biomass. It has three primary conversion, uh, four primary conversion technologies, wind turbines, solar PV, biogas, and pyrolysis one interim technology, energy storage, and then three downstream conversion technologies, hydrogen, ammonia, and methanol. These eight technologies are all that we need to build the energy system of the future. They are necessary, and they are also sufficient. We don't need all of them all the time. We can combine them in different ways. Next, please. We could decide that it is all about getting electricity 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And for that, we need some sort of electricity production, wind or, so or solar power, and then storage. Next, please. We could also make solar power transportable, not just producing le electricity for local users of a grid we might not be able to extend, but converting it into transportable energy forms, such as ammonia. You can think of that as portable solar power. Solar power that's not restricted by grid access. Next, please. Or we could do liquid fuels based on a combination of, of uh, bioenergy, here pyrolysis that delivers oil, and then uh, gases that together with hydrogen from solar or wind can deliver methanol. There are other ways we can do it. It's not so important, but the important thing here is that we can get all that we need with known technologies. We don't need to invent anything new. Our task is now to make those technologies that are not yet in mass production into standardized, modularized building blocks that can be mass produced. We need that to get the cost down. This system can deliver all we need but it cannot be done just by one country. Next, please. When India recently assumed the G20 presidency, His Excellency Prime Minister Modi made a number of statements. One resonates particularly with today and with our visit here to India. Next, please. Today, the greatest challenges we face, climate change, terrorism, and pandemics, can be solved not by fighting each other, but only by acting together. My vision is that we do exactly that, that we act together, that we build a new energy system, that we develop the mass production of the building blocks, and that the building blocks are made here in India. Wind power accounts for about 7% of to total global electricity generation. And as far as I can, can calculate, it uh, prevents the emission of about 3.5% of fossil fuel emissions. Supplies from Danish companies account for about 25% of the installed capacity. The other 75% are made elsewhere, but they're all based on the Danish concepts. 
From a distance, you cannot tell them apart. At their heart, they are Danish. Not bad for a country with 0.1% of the global population to pave the way for 3.5% of global emission reductions. Next, please. This is then uh, my vision. Next, please. That we should do it again, but we should do it with a much higher ambition than the 3.5%. Next, please. That we do that together, not as a single nation. Next, please but by acting together. India, Denmark, other countries who can contribute to these solutions. Next, please. Denmark has the skills. India has the scale. We've heard that many times. It is true. We should not forget the India population is 200 times the Danish population. Can you imagine that? That is where we get impact for our skills. And let us not forget India has a hugely fast-growing skill base already. We just need to help that improve even further. Let's combine that, those factors to make the energy transition happen faster and better than ever before by making this new energy system. Next, please. And then, of course, finally, let India assume the, its place as the beacon of the energy transition in Asia and in the world. Once more, I'm deeply grateful for my, this opportunity to share my vision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stiesdale. <coughs> and as you heard from Mr. Stiesdale, uh, it's not just about wind power. Uh, wind power is not the only renewable energy source that's necessary to mitigate climate change and create growth. And therefore, I'm very proud to announce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Ajay Mathur. Uh, he is central to the deployment of solar energy globally as the Director General in the Delhi-based International Solar Alliance. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. We are here in extremely interesting times. Each one of you brings to this room energy, and not just in what we are talking about, but hopefully a lot more that can help us all come together under this mantra that you just talked of scale and skills. We have seen a very exciting year, both at the International Solar Alliance and in India. We have seen a huge growth across the world in an agreement that electricity from solar and from wind would together be the force of the future. As you rightly mentioned, this is something that is happening in most of the uh, uh, geographies around the world. Solar and wind electricity is the cheapest form of electricity, much cheaper than even fossil fuel based electricity, of course, when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. The good thing is that in many parts of the world, including parts of this country, we find that there are opportunities where the two, wind and solar, occur together. And therefore, you get a relatively constant source of electricity from the two occurring together. But there are other parts where that doesn't happen. And therefore, we are looking beyond that and I look forward the vision that you have put forward of converting this into a variety of sources, particularly fuels that could be used in industry. A fuel that has been of great discussion in India has been hydrogen. Use the solar and the wind electricity to electrolyze water and produce the green hydrogen that can then fuel industry. There's a lot of money that has been put into it. In the budget that was announced uh, a few, uh, well, almost exactly a month ago, it was proposed that about two and a half billion dollars would be invested in the uh, development of domestic solar cells and modules. Why? Because when you make them, they're more expensive than the current ones in the market. 
This means that you need to provide short-term incentives. The good thing is that this program called the Production Linked Incentive Program is about manufacturing, but the incentives are paid when you sell them and you sell more efficient cells. That is good because it builds in the natural, the virtuous cycle of innovation as well. We, I look forward to strong partnership which helps not only the solar sector but also in the wind sector, this kind of partnership to build in more efficient technologies as time goes by. Similarly in hydrogen, about two and a half billion dollars has been in, has been set aside this year in the budget for investment in hydrogen because as I mentioned we are looking at electricity from solar, wind, biomass, nuclear, non-fossil fuel, hydro to be complemented by hydrogen in the industrial sector where it is used as a fuel. We are looking at an approximately three to four times increase in the hydrogen use that is occurring now largely in refineries and fertilizer. This means that there is a great potential for hydrogen use not only in India but across the world. The International Solar Alliance recently carried out a study for Africa and found that the Mor Mauritania, Morocco area could produce hydrogen which was amazingly inexpensive and could compete with the hydrogen that is produced from, the, from gas. This pro provides the kind of uh, markets that we need for efficient electrolyzers, for efficient cells, to be put in place so that we produce the hydrogen that can power the world. I look forward to this collaboration and to the India-Denmark partnership so that this can move to the future. I only point out that this is an area in which every country in the world is moving ahead and we need to keep pace with it. We need to learn from what is happening across the world. I thank you for your participation and for your interest. Thank you so much, Mr. Mathieu. Uh, actually, we also had a discussion at the reception last night, uh, and we agreed that what we should do now is not just keep talking. We, act, we should act. So we should actually do it. And I guess that's also why we are here, the big Danish delegation, and also the, the, the Indian delegation being in this room, is because we want to act, not just to talk. So I would like you to, to thank all the three of our speakers here. And now we're moving on to the panel debate. So thank you so much. <laughs> and we are going to have a change of pers persons on, on the scene. So I would like to invite the panelists. Well, first they're going to have a photo. So for the panel, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Caroline Pantabidan. Uh, Ms. Sabidan is Executive Vice President and Chief of Corporate Affairs uh, in AP Müller Mask. So please join the scene. I'd also like to invite uh, Mr. Morten Dürholm. Uh, Mr. Dürholm is also Executive Vice President, but it's for Global Marketing, Communications, Sustainability and Public Affairs at Vistas. Uh, the third one on the floor, I would like to invite Mr. Rajiv Ganju. Uh, he's senior vice president at the uh, Indian uh, company uh, named Lumin Lum Luminous. 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 <laughs> and uh, the, our fourth member of the panel is uh, Ms. Therese Boarding Hermann. She is director of global public affairs at Topsu. And finally, uh, I would like to invite the Secretary General of the European Stores Associations in Belgium, Mr. Petrick Clerc. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Good. So. So, 
I have one question I would like to ask all of you. And I think uh, it's a question where we might be talking on this level, and then later on in the panel we might go narrow down to be more practical. But the question is, what is the most decisive step we should take to reach the climate targets set in the Paris Agreement? So, what should we do? Should we start with you, Caroline? Well, I think... Is it on? Yeah. It, I think we should combine the, the skill and the scale, uh, and then we should uh, definitely not uh, forget, as has been mentioned uh, several times actually today, uh, the, the regulatory framework uh, that uh, is, is necessary with uh, both, as, as was just mentioned uh, during the last presentation, both the, the subsidies, uh, but, but in, in our view also other sorts of, uh, you know, the opposite of in incentives, uh, taxes, so, so that we ensure that uh, it is actually a level playing field between the old fuels and the new fuels. Uh, I, th I think that's, that's actually the, uh, the most important thing and, and also all the uh, the standards that, that is necessary in order for us all to co collaborate on, on a global basis. If we don't uh, collaborate on the same uh, page, uh, it, it will uh, at least take a lot longer and there will be a lot of waste in the system and that will be, uh, that will be sad. So financing and standards, you could say. So, Mr. Mr. Ganju, what, what do you think we should do? So I think uh, I tend to agree with what Carolyn said that uh, since morning we have told that so Denmark has the skill and we have the scale. So I think we can work out this uh, partnership fantastically and we can learn those technologies. We have the scale. Already India, if you talk about Indian corporates, we are already on the journey of sustainable energy because we think that if we have to be in the future market and if we have to really protect the planet and give good planet to our future generations, we have to look into those aspects. So based on that, so we are already working on solar, we are working on biomass, we are working on hydrogen, we are working on other kind of alternate energies we can use. Not only we are thinking of creating those energy, but how we can storage also, so store those energies also so that we give uninterrupted power not only to India but to emerging economies where there are power interruptions. So we are working on those technologies and I think there will be, it will be great partnership between Denmark and us where we can do these things. And the help required is, like we told, we have, want a level playing field, we want to focus on standards so that standards are common. And we also want to, what Minister said today, the free trade agreement, which will help business to business connect much in a much better way. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Clerong. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invite. Um, basically, there are two points you can say. One is technology, and the second one is market design. So you need to develop the technology, and you need to have the revenues to roll this technology out and reduce the barriers. This includes the permitting, the free trade and all this which is needed. If the industry who develop this technology don't make money with it, it's not working. The technology as such is not enough to be done alone. If you look, we are having very efficient renewable energy sources now. A lot of wind, offshore wind, onshore wind, we heard it. A huge evolution in the last decades. But we also see in Europe we want to triple the renewable in the next eight years. That's the aim stated by the European institutions, by the Commission. If we do this, we will unfortunately in Europe curtail the, uh, triple the curtailment or even more than triple the curtailment because it's not possible to get all this electricity at the right moment into the system. So you need to include the storage to avoid curtailing. So it's good to increase the renewables, but you need to increase also the penetration of these renewables and therefore you really need to make it matching. So it's a market design and the technology will save us. Perfect. And Mr. Duholm? Can I start by saying maybe we should stop using the phrase Denmark has the skills, India has the scale. I mean, it does not sound right. And I actually don't think it's true. Uh, I think actually somehow it's opposite. You know, India has the skills, but it doesn't actually have the scale. And I think that's one of the fundamental problems. 
I mean, a place like India is building around a gigawatt of onshore wind a year. That's less than Finland with five million people. And we are focusing a lot on that one gigawatt and not on the seven, eight, ten gigawatts that is not being built in India and asking the questions, why are they not being built? And I think to solve the climate crisis, there's one, if I can just stay in headlines, there's one fundamental thing we need to get right. Stop looking at renewables only from a low-cost prism. Because if we only look at it as, at low cost, then we stop focusing on the values that it generates. And then we don't incentivize the production of renewables in a way that we get to that part. It's not just in India, it's also in Europe. The wind market is down a third last year. At the same time, all of us are talking about energy independence, climate change, all these things. But we fail to remunerate and put a price point on renewables that actually incentivizes investments. And that's the same for India. And I think it's beautiful to have a target of 450 gigawatt. And I think it's beautiful to have so many skillful Indian colleagues as we have. We have 3,700. But they would love to start producing turbines here in India for the Indian market. But right now it's all exported. And I think that's a shame. So let's focus on what kind of market design needs to happen in order to get to the 8 gigawatts a year, which is what we need to do. Also before we talk, start talking hydrogen and all the other things, because you need the green electrons before you start talking about hydrogen. So, Ed Therese, what do you say? Yeah, thank you. I think everything is well uh, placed uh, to, to, to set the scene. I think uh, I, I totally agree with, uh, with Morten on the renewable uh, energy, and we have to ramp that up. Obviously, it's fundamental for us to get the electrons to do the green uh, molecules. But eventually, I mean, today, green hydrogen is like champagne. It's, uh, it's produced in very small amounts in very few regions, and it's super expensive. We really want it to become like water. It has to be abundance. It has to be produced in several regions around the world, and it has to be affordable. So we have to bring the cost down on green hydrogen and 60, 70 percent of the cost is the renewable electricity. So it's closely linked. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I wrote a lot of notes here. Standards, uh, free markets, uh, better trade, financing, level playing field, uh, technology, and especially this about the costs that are, that are too high. Uh, and uh, we, should, uh, we should focus on all this. And also the skills. I, I agreed with Mr. Dürholm that uh, skills is important, but you need to use the skills right. Um, I would like to, to, to touch upon this about the standards, because uh, you mentioned that uh, in, your, in your presentation, Caroline, and, and how do you see, what, what is your perspective more on the standards? Uh, what, what should be done? Well, when, when we, we talk uh, from our perspective, our industry, uh, we, we are of course the customer, uh, and, and, and we are also a co-developer, but, but, but only actually because there's not enough, uh, and, and we need it fairly soon. So the targets are set, and it's uh, about uh, walking the talk, and, and, and that's, uh, that's where we come from. When we then come to the standard, it, it's because as a global company, we, we kind of need it globally. Uh, and and it, it doesn't really uh, make any sense that everybody uh, start up in vote inventing their own system and then we should use a lot of years uh, trying to make it into one standard. I mean, I mean that, that's, uh, I think that's one of the issues. Then, then we fortunately have a, uh, an international body uh, that is regulating uh, the mar maritime industry and, and that's a super starting point. Uh, the, the less super starting point is that it's, uh, it's, it's the states that are the only one that is driving the standards in, in, in that. And we have heard a lot of good things today, I think, from, from, the, uh, from, from Denmark and, and from, from India as well, that uh, they, they really want this to happen but they're kind of a little behind uh, the industries. I mean, because we have our goals and, and we cannot wait. So we are in an organization that has a goal saying 50% reduction in 50, and we have a goal in Maersk that says 100% in 40. That simply doesn't really match. And, and just as um, I was just talking here at lunch, that uh, 
you know, nobody, none of us would go out today, likely not, and buy a washing machine that is not an A or B, uh, an even better, an A something, right? And, and that's also a standard that needs to be uh, made so that the ships are put into that machine and we get rid of the bad ones. So all the Fs go out and, and more A's in. And, and in, in order for that to happen, we, we simply need something that is truly global from the start. Or at least that would be super smart because then we don't waste the time of having to repair it afterwards. Thank you so much. I would like to ask, a, well, you can just raise your hand if you want to, to ship in or a comment on, on, on what has been said. Uh, yes, but, and, and I would like to raise another question because what you said, Caroline, was actually that the politicians, they are lagging behind. So uh, they are not the, the, the front runners. You say the industry is actually the front runners. So I would like to have some comments on that also from the other panelists. But Teresa, you have the first. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I agree around the, the standards is, uh, is the glue uh, that will enable uh, the, the trade of, of, of green hydrogen and all its derivatives, basically. But it's also mutual recognition of standards uh, so that you will see uh, the EU is coming out with a standard now and then the, the US uh, accepting that and vice versa. I think that would be maybe the more easiest way than, uh, than try to create a, a global standard. Yeah, thank you. And what about the wind sector, Morten? Well, I, I applaud Ms. Pontoffi then for what you're doing at, at Maersk and, and everyone else who volunteers to become off-takers of this exciting uh, uh, new energy, um, it's not new, but, but the hydrogen economy. And I think it's fantastic. And it hopefully will help drive also more demand for renewables. My only concern with this is that what I started by saying, if you just take away those electrons that you actually you need to use to green the electricity system, and you put them over in the ships instead, then you haven't really won anything. And, and so for the policy makers, we have to join up and say, in order for the green economy or the green hydrogen economy to take off, we cannot leave the path of, elect of, of greening the electricity system. It has to go hand in hand. And therefore, we not only need to double or triple or quadruple the amount of electrons, we actually have to think much, much bigger. And that requires us to think about the bottlenecks. And right now, for example, in Europe and many other places, it's permitting. We have some 80 gigawatts of wind power stuck in administration, for example. The good news about such things is that that's fairly easy to fix if you start looking at it, but then we need to convince policymakers to start looking at it, right? And that's where we have a joint interest in both the P2X, the off-takers, and us in the uh, renewable industry. So, and is it the same case with the storage? Maybe the most important point is to realize, and that's what we're discussing now, the sector interfaces going from electricity to transport to heating to cooling. And that's where we'll have synergies growing. And it's, it's still missing quite a lot. When we talk about storage here, we talk about batteries and hydrogen. That's what we're talking about. Mostly it's, that's the discourse. Nobody talks about heat storage. Half of the energy is used in Europe for heating or cooling of buildings. But nobody talks about heat storage, yes. which is the Mr. cheapest Cleron, way. You have to keep the mic a bit closer so to your mouth. Which is, the, which is the cheapest way of storing. So it's about getting electricity into the transport sector, into the heating sector, into the cooling sector, and, and into all the other parts. And only if we get the synergies done, then we have uh, the chance to avoid spilling and wasting renewable electricity and renewable energy really in a massive scale. But therefore, the market design is not there. If I talk about the UK now, you, you receive 120 pounds if you curtail a megawatt hour of electricity offshore wind. We would store it for less than this amount and bring it for free back to the market in a moment. But there's no revenue stream, there's no market design. And why is this that therefore the investors do not come in? Because they don't know how long this will last. Is this now with the Russian invasion a specific moment? Will it change in one year, in five years? And therefore, it's important to show from a policy side, in India, in Europe, anywhere, that you mean it. And if you have energy storage targets to flesh out, industry believes in this and says we're going there. We saw it with the renewable targets. That's how we got off with the renewable technologies, and it's good so. And we should do the same with energy storage, fleshing out targets and getting industry and investors believing in it. And what is the Indian perspective on this? So... So I'm basically from Luminous, wherein we are into energy solution business. 
So we produce, uh, like we give, one is uninterrupted power supply. We make inverters, and we also make storage. Like uh, Patrick said, we made, make batteries. Not, uh, we make lead acid as well as lithium ion batteries. We use the alternate uh, technology also for producing the batteries. So what I will, like Patrick rightly said, that when we talk about batteries, so we have to have clear-cut standards that we have to recycle. The more we recycle them, the better it is. The standards have to be globally standard together so that we re recycle them. We have a clear policy on how do we recycle them. Second thing when we talk about solar is like we have different efficiency cells being used today so that to have a level playing field so we can have those efficiencies defined so that these grade A cells, grade B cells, grade C cells do not so that the there is a transparent transparency in the consumer's mind also that what kind of cells we are using. And finally, we come about the efficiency. We have B in India, so which talks about efficiency everywhere. So once B becomes popular in all other sectors, most of the sectors it is, so we will have level playing field. We will have good standards across all, whether it is heating, whether it is cooling, whether it is energy generating through solar or alternate energy or energy storage. So I would like to ask you, Teresa, about, uh, well, uh, the, the green fuel that you are actually starting to produce. Uh, how, can you tell us how, 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 how well, when, when, will, when, will, when will we actually be able to have the green fuels to put on the ships from Maersk, or to put on the airplanes and so on? How far are we from that? I get this question quite often. <laughs> Uh, well, but um, I, I just to put, to put straight, uh, we produce the electricity or the technology, the technology to produce the green fuel. So uh, electrolyzer manufacturing uh, technology um, is, is what we do, uh, and that will enable uh, everyone that has a power to X uh, uh, plant to produce uh, green hydrogen and its derivatives. But then um, last week, actually, we announced a global cooperation with Sasol. Um, a leading South African energy company to do a joint venture uh, to produce uh, sustainable aviation fuel. And it's super exciting. We are moving into a completely new business model that we have never been, been, uh, been, been doing before. So we will start producing uh, sustainable aviation fuel globally um, in a joint venture with uh, Sasol. And we hope uh, that we'll be ready to produce it uh, within uh, the next five years. So it will be coming on the market uh, as, as, as fast as possible um, and maybe, maybe before that time. Uh, but our um, solid oxide electrolyzer technology will be ready next year in large scale. So basically uh, it up, it's up for grasp <laughs> for everyone who wants to produce uh, essential uh, synthetic fuels and, and green fuels and e-jet uh, to, to make it. So as mentioned in the panel, uh, the previous panel, all the technology is there. It's not. It's it's not unavailable. Uh, it's it's on the market uh, very soon, and it will be more and more uh, energy efficient uh, to to drive down the costs, also the loss of energy in all its conversions. So in in that respect, I think it's more about like the chicken and the egg situation still, um, and also to get enough renewable energy to produce these essential fuels, because obviously we believe that electrification is the first uh, mean, and then you have to, to use it for, for decarbonization of the hard to bait sectors. That's the second priority. Yeah. And you mentioned this about the hen on the egg, uh, because I know that in Maersk, you said, Caroline, that you are going to reduce your CO2 emissions uh, dramatically by, by 2040. Uh, you're also building new, 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 uh, new ships. Uh, are these new ships prepared for the new fuels? the green fuels that we're going to have? Yes, yes they are. Uh, we have, I mean, we, we have a zero target in 40. We have a half, 50% already in 30. That's really soon. Uh, and we are not going to order any ships anymore uh, that is not going to be able to sail on the green fuels. So I, I completely agree that, uh, you know, it, it's... It, Everybody has the scale. It, it's pretty s visible that it, it's a, it's a, a, everybody is kind of contributing uh, globally. Uh, and, and we definitely need 
the scale. So, I mean, four gigawatt, uh, which I just heard, uh, is, is, is nice. Uh, but we alone need 60, six zero. Uh, and we need it by 40, uh, and we need half of it by 30. Uh, so so it, 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 there we go back to the governments, because the permits, it's, it's not in five years, it's now, uh, because it needs to be built now. And, and in order for us to get to the green fuel, we have like two chemical plants also that need to be created. So all that takes time. Uh, so, so we kind of in a hurry. Uh, if 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 we are going, uh, if we need, I mean, we want to succeed, uh, but somebody else needs to help us. Uh, and and there comes, uh, you know, all good skills, uh, whether it's uh, making the windmills or making it uh, store it, uh, making the the two plants and making the fuels, and then make it, the whole process a lot more efficient. And then also combined with having the right price point, because if our customers are not going to buy it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so, you know, everything goes hand in hand, and, and all the steps uh, need to be in the equation for this to succeed. So, in a short comment, Theresa? Yeah, I think it's one thing is what is maybe very much overlooked uh, is actually the electrolyzer manufacturing capacity. Um, it's very limited today. Uh, I, I read and I heard today that, uh, that India is, is aiming for 60 to 100 uh, gigawatt of electrolyzer, uh, electrolyzer uh, capacity installed. Um, and today, glo at global level, we are only at 3 gigawatt. Uh, and the EU is at uh, 1.75 uh, gigawatt. Uh, one gigawatt in the EU uh, today installed uh, capacity. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, the, 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 the need to scale up fast, and, and it's, it's, it's almost impossible, right? So I think you, you really need to, to understand how much, how fast we should go and the, the leapfrogs that is needed to get there. Permit is, permitting is, is one thing, but bringing the, the technology to the scale needed to cater for uh, masks demand and airlines demands and uh, other uh, hard to abate sectors, refineries, uh, there would be so many end users uh, of, of green hydrogen and its derivatives and you really need to scale up throughout the whole value chain. So, Morten, will you be ready? To, are you ready to, 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 to produce all these windmills and to put up all these windmills that's actually needed so we can have the green electricity? Absolutely. I mean, we have demonstrated that. I mean, the wind industry will hit the one terawatt mark in June this year, the global wind industry. Uh, and that's come from a very low base and it's gone very fast. So, whenever we uh, see ambitions out there becomes tangible, we are ready to do it. I mean, it's not a matter of supply chain. I mean, right now it's a matter of getting projects. And, I mean, the, as we've saying here, one of the bottlenecks is permitting. Uh, Germany came out and was, they were so proud they could build two LNG terminals in, in seven months, right? It takes 10 years to get a permit in Germany for wind. And we have to be angry about that. You know, all of us, we have to start yelling about it because that, that's not the way to go forward. And will you in India also be ready with the solar power and the green electricity so, so we can actually have these hydrogen plants? Yes, since morning we have been saying that we have PLI now in solar. So we are starting cell manufacturing in India and we ourselves are making panel and uh, we are making one gig plant. And now the, the, you can see that awareness has increased that the plant we are making will be net zero. So plant will use complete green energy and it will be green certified right from building to net zero means it will produce its own energy and produce the solar panel to give energy, clean energy to Indian customers as well. So India is in a big way there. So government is, uh, this PLI scheme is very useful for us to do level playing field. Now we have to focus how we can partner like wind, wind is there, solar is here and we have to focus on those the technologies of future, like we talk about TopCon. So far we have poly and we have monopark here, but we have to focus on TopCon and more so we have to see how we can collaborate to see perovskites. This raw material is mostly available in Europe, so we have to see that how we can, because it has the highest sun, uh, sun absorbing capacity and it is better than silicon. 
So efficiency is much better. The best efficiency with silicon is, goes up to 25%. And when we talk about perovskites, it's more than 30%. So you can imagine how efficient we can be. And this raw material is widely available than silicon, which is limited to various few countries. So India is geared up for everything sustainable and clean. Okay, and now I got the signal from uh, Freya saying that, uh, well, we have to close the session because it's 4 o'clock. I would like to thank you all. And just to say, well, I took a lot of notes, and I, you, as it was mentioned, I'm a former politician. And uh, I, I, I really noted that what we need is also that the politicians, they act and they not just talk. This is getting permits, getting every standards, getting uh, tax credits or whatever that's needed so we can actually move forward with the green energy. So thank you so much to the whole panel.
May I request all of you to please take your seats. You can bring in your cups of coffee or tea or whatever and please come in and take your seat. We'd like to start the session on time. panelists here and uh, may I start with inviting Mr. Michael Koch, Director and Head of Unit National Board of Trade Sweden, Mr. Shirish Joshi, Chief Business Officer and President Network Expansion, Open Network for Digital Commerce, ONDC India, Mr. Frederick Anden Sandberg, Head of Public Affairs, APAC Vestas Denmark, Mr. Piyush Kumar, Mr. Piyush Kumar, Additional Secretary, Department of Commerce, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. I think he's on his way. He will join us soon. And uh, His Excellency, Mr. Carolus Zemaitis, Vice Minister, Ministry of Economy and Innovation, Republic of Lithuania. Oh, he's here, right. And to moderate the session, I'd like to invite Mr. Vinod Sharma, Chairman CI National Committee on ICTE, Manufacturing and Managing Director, Deki Electronics India. We, as you can hear the bell ringing, we'll have everybody in the hall, but we can start the session now. And for that, I'd like to request Mr. Sharma to give his opening remarks and take the session forward. All the business and all the sustainability that we discussed since morning will be delivered through some global value chain somewhere. And that's the relevance of our panel uh, this evening. Uh, His Excellency Mr. Karolis Zimatis, uh, the Vice Minister for Economy Innovation uh, Lithuania, uh, our, our beloved guest this evening. Uh, Mr. Piyush Kumar, uh, the additional secretary of the Department of Commerce, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. He will be joining us shortly, I'm told. Mr. Michael Koch, the head of the unit for National Board of Trade Sweden. Uh, Mr. Sirish Joshi, uh, the chief business officer, uh, president of the network expansion for ONDC India. And ONDC, as you will hear, is going to be a disruptor of value chains across the world, as starting with India. Uh, Mr. Frederick Andren Sandberg, the head of public affairs for Vestas, uh, Denmark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good evening and welcome to this very important session on recalibrating global value chains. Such an opportunity to recalibrate these chains, I think, comes once in a lifetime. Uh, in my personal opinion, the last time we tried to do that, uh, our friends from America, lots of our friends from Europe, and the rest of the world that followed them, we decided to put all our eggs in one basket. Uh, and some of those results are now beginning to tell. So I think it's time for us to reflect uh, to redesign, uh, maybe rewire, and certainly recalibrate these global value chains. 
We are privileged today to have with us His Excellency, Mr. Zebetis. Uh, we deeply appreciate your interest in India, sir, and thank you for joining us at this conference, where your insights into the current trade situation in the Baltic region and the bilateral trade would help Indian, in Indian industry, and I'm sure the rest of us, leverage the opportunities and expand our footprint in the region. It's also a very special honor, Mr. Piyush Kumar, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, to have Mr. Piyush Kumar, Additional Secretary in the Department of Commerce, Ministry of Commerce and Industry in the Government of India. Uh, he's been a great friend of the Indian industry over the years, and we are certainly grateful to have you here today uh, to hear your insights. May I also welcome the distinguished panelists from Sweden and Denmark. At a time when CII is the B20 India Secretariat, the global presence at the India-Europe Business and Sustainability Center, uh, Conclave reflects the progress that B20 can make together. Mr. Joshi of ONDC, as I mentioned, uh, will also add, I think, this afternoon or this evening, a new dimension to the GVC dialogue. Uh, I wish to thank you all in advance for the insights that we are about to receive. Uh, this session, uh, of course, focuses on a very, very relevant theme. More than two-thirds of global trade occurs within global chains today. Uh, I think it's the first year, or rather the last year, was the first year where global GDP growth actually was slightly higher than global trade growth. Uh, and uh, I think it's 2.5 and 2.3 percent, respectively. So these recent disruptions in the value chain have, of course, highlighted the need, as I already said, for this recalibration. B20 India has constituted a task force on global value chains with a specific focus on how to make them more resilient and inclusive. Four priorities are being discussed in the task force, including building resilience, adoption of new technologies for trade, expanding trade in services, and making GVCs more inclusive with greater participation of less developed countries, MSMEs, women, and youth-led businesses. Through this task force, we aim to come up with tangible and actionable recommendations that will have a long-lasting outcome. European nations will have a key role to play in these deliberations. Here I have three points to make on building resilience in the supply chains. First, GVC must be diversified both geographically and sectorally if we have to learn from our lessons of the past. Through distributed sourcing, companies can reduce their reliance on any one supplier or geographical region, which is quite obvious, uh, making them less vulnerable to disruptions. Second, another approach can be to increase transparency and traceability throughout the supply chain. By improving the visibility of the supply chain, companies can better anticipate and hopefully mitigate future disruptions. This can be achieved through the use of new digital technologies, and the world needs to obviously invest in them. Third, we must consider environmentally sustainable and social respo socially responsible uh, behavior as part of these resilient GVCs. Green supply chains will involve vendors across the supply chains in different countries going green as well as greening of the transportation and manufacturing. An inclusive, more responsive, diverse, reliable GVC is the requirement of the day. A winner-takes-all approach which was the approach of the past, should, in my opinion, be dispersed, should be replaced with a more equitable, transparent, and fair allocation of value. Robust global value chains, which have deep value addition embedded in them, are, an essential, uh, are essential to establishing what I would call meaningful livelihoods. Uh, we know that a lot of our schemes, and we've spoken about, about PLI, I've heard in the morning, uh, are very good schemes. Uh, however, I think they need to be sort of now re-engineered for how they can apply to SMEs, the smaller and medium enterprises across the world, in India and across the world. Europe has faced significant shocks to its trade over the last three years and is in the process of reshaping its value chains. India as a large market and a rapidly developing trade economy can play a key role in helping European economies develop new sources and new markets. Our strengthening partnership over the years with the European Union augurs well for such a recalibration of global value chains. I now look forward to hearing uh, the insights uh, from our distinguished panel this afternoon. Uh, may I begin uh, by inviting Mr. Michael Koch. Uh, you may want to come here or you can use the chair there uh, to make your comments, sir.
Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, recently the Federation of Swedish Industry made a survey of its members who are trading with China. It turned out that 43% of the companies said that they would buy less products from China the next two years. This is, of course, an indication of what the global value chains are facing, uh, the challenges. The, uh, the, the challenges are two, twofold. We have one which is company-driven, where companies have eternal considerations like uh, cost of production, cost of logistics, but this is also teamed up now with a recent experience during the pandemic, and lessons learned in the hard way of not being as diverse as they maybe have, should have been. On top of that comes a lot of state intervention in a world where geopolitics create a lot of tensions. So they are also facing, the companies are also facing a lot of new impositions, including export ban bans on technology, sanctions where some markets are closed down and some production facilities are closed down. And of course, this all gives rise to the old expression, a terrible one to use, but never waste a good crisis. There are opportunities here. There are changing trade patterns here. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of this can, can then be, uh, end up in other places. But I would then, so we see the recalibration. There are grounds for that. We will see it. Uh, we will see a healthy increase in the trade relationship with, between EU and India. I'm sure of that. How much of the uh, trade that has previously been elsewhere that will move to India is, however, I mean, it's a little bit too early, I think, to bring out the champagne and the party gear. Uh, we maybe should wait a little bit uh, because there are still some concerns. If you look at the companies, what they are also saying, the Swedish companies that are leaving China, they're also saying that they will move their production back to EU uh, because there is still uncertainty out in the world. And that's their lesson, that they will bring production home and they will try to diversify and still have some production in China as well. But I think that the, the outlook is still that they are looking for other markets, that is, there is a possibility in this. But there is then the question of certainty because there is nowadays, given the situation in the world, an increased value on certainty. If you can give certainty to companies, a larger degree on this. And that's my important message today, that we should invest in certainty. And how do we do that in our relationship? Well, my belief is there is one thing on the table here, and that is an agreement between EU and India that would give more certainty to companies about the future because that would give a long time commitment and reduce the political risk for investment and things like that. So that is what I hope that we can do today that we can, as other speakers have said, that we can energize the process. And it's a little bit now if you see the, the, uh, the because what you can get also from a, a, a trade agreement is, among other things, uh, you can get uh, investment protection part of the agreement, which is really important. You can also bring in standards and the mutual recognition, which is super important in a, in a world which tends to diverse standards. And you also have another important thing that you can cover, and that is the transfer of digital data. So, um, because that's really important as well in a, in, a, in, a, in a world where services are more and more important when it comes to trade. And we tend not to see them sometimes because goods are more tangible. But of course, the, the dealing in, in services and digital trade is becoming so important. So that could also be an important part of a trade agreement. So, um, that is the, 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 my, my important point, and if you see, you can almost see this as a narrative talking about it as a, as a Hollywood or Bollywood romantic film where you have, like you have here, love in the room between EU and uh, India, and then you know what happens. There are some problems. Uh, there are uh, problems uh, finding a way forward, but in the end, 
there is this massive wedding. And that's what we hope for in terms of a, a, a great agreement. And I would like to finish off by uh, saying that the only difference you will find between the marriage and the, the, the trade agreement is that the trade agreement will actually make both families richer uh, after the marriage, uh, which is not the case normally. Because we know from, from uh, research that actually we see a rise in GDP after a free trade agreement and that goes for both the partners in the free trade agreement and we see the more, we, uh, uh, the more comprehensive, the deeper the agreement, the higher the gain in GDP terms. So let's try and see if we can energize this and get this marriage uh, because I think that this will definitely benefit both sides. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Kok, yeah, for reminding us about the need for China plus one, but also reminding us that we are not the only girl in town. Uh, we need to be careful about that, not pop the champagne too early, uh, but I totally agree with you that the marriage, uh, this one will certainly help, hopefully, in prosperity for all of us. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Mr. Sirish Joshi. Uh, he is the chief business officer, as I said, and the president for network expansion uh, for the open network for digital commerce. Members of the panel and the audience, good afternoon. The birth of ONDC, Open Network of Digital Commerce, was actually the start of the first wave of the pandemic. And around the world at that time, as governments came to grips with what to do, one of the initial protective steps everyone was taking was locking down movement of the population so as to not overwhelm the health authorities. And when you lock down a billion plus people, it begs a few related questions. How will people access their food? How will people access their medicines? That began a questioning into examining a distant way of doing commerce as opposed to the physical way. And e-commerce penetration back in 2020 was just barely 2%. So there began a journey of developing a system, a mechanism, by which e-commerce could be available to everyone. Now e-commerce has been present for more than a decade in this country. A lot of companies have invested billions of dollars and yet the penetration is low. And the penetration is low because e-commerce, while it comes with promise, comes with constraints. First of all, in every sphere of e-commerce, whether it is taxi services, whether it is food ordering, whether it is household products, whether it is B2B, it follows a certain path. It follows a path of a closed commerce where the buyer and seller both have to be registered in the same application on the same platform. And because of that nature, all the investment, all the energy goes into building scale and in every sphere, you have only one or two players that achieve scale, and by the time you get to the third and fourth player, you really run into non-participants. That also creates a shift in power structure, and that also makes it difficult for broad-scale participation. Because today, if you think about a seller, a seller is interested in e-commerce because they get scale. They want to access millions of buyers. But when you join these scale platforms, you have to follow their rules. So you can send the right product to the right customer in time, but if the customer says, I want to send it back, then the seller is the one who has to bear that additional cost of getting it back. And if it's a replacement, then there's a third leg of journey they have to pay. In physical commerce, a customer comes into your store, they pay you money right away. But in e-commerce, you may have to wait several days before you get your money. The commission you have to pay. So the commercial terms and conditions of e-commerce are actually not amenable for small retailers. And therefore, no surprise, less than 1% of retailers in India are on e-commerce. So how do you change this? How do you create a system where everybody participates? The fundamental design principle of ONDC is about unbundling e-commerce. So today we expect e-commerce to be done by one entity, end-to-end, -end, from buyer to seller activities to shipment to technology, everything in between. But what if you were to unbundle it? Now, unbundling is something we experience in many walks of our life. In fact, one of the things India is known for is business process outsourcing. And what is that but unbundling? Companies have concluded that there are certain business processes that are more efficiently and better run by somebody outside the organization, whether it is customer care or payroll and so on, these services are shipped to an organization outside. So you've unbundled your business process. No car maker makes their own tires. So even products are unbundled. That does not mean we get bumpy rides. So it's possible to unbundle services. It's possible to unbundle products. Let each entity do what they are very good at and allow them to connect with each other. How do you allow them to connect with each other? You create a protocol, a communication method. 
and we are familiar with protocol. So we do protocol when we do emails every day. We have an email client, the party we are sending an email to may have a very different email client and yet emails go back and forth. You look at payment systems, in the old days it was checkbook, in the international system we have SWIFT, in India we have NEFT, IMPS, UPI, in all of these two parties don't have to have accounts in the same bank. So you can send money from one account to another, through one application to another, completely seamlessly. These are interoperable systems. E-commerce is not interoperable. And so when you unbundle the value chain, you need to create a language equivalent of the SMTP or the HTTP or the QR code of UPI that allows these different entities to be able to operate with each other. That's what ONDC has created. Now, what does this lead to? It might sound like a very simple change, but actually leads to something very, very powerful. First, it allows parties that are not in e-commerce today to become part of e-commerce very easily. Because if you just simply split into very three simplistic levels, every e-commerce marketplace or platform has three essential components. There is the buyer side activities, where the buyers are searching, adding to cart, making payment, that's the buyer side activities. Then there's the seller side activities, where the sellers are uploading their catalogs, updating their inventory, managing their orders or changes, cancellations, etc. And if it is a physical good, then somebody is picking up that product from the seller's location and delivering it to the buyer's location. And these three activities are connected internally in that platform through their own protocol. Now, if you allow different entities to do different activities, so let's say there is a group of companies that are only doing buyer activities. And there are lots of organizations today that have a pool of people that can become buyers. Banks have buyers, and collectively banks in India have several hundred million buyers. Telecom companies have users, they can become buyers. The three top telecom companies in India collectively have more than a billion users. So if you allow these companies to pool in their user bases as buyers, you have a huge buyer, uh, buyer pool that's actually much larger than any of the existing e-commerce marketplaces. Similarly, you allow other parties to contribute sellers. You have accounting software companies that do point of sale software. And point of sale software, by virtue of its role, knows the catalog of that store, knows the inventory of that store. That's why you can get an invoice when you leave that store. But when that same software adopts the ONDC protocol, those stores become visible to the network. And so you have a large pool of organizations, internet service providers, uh, commercial banks, uh, accounting software companies who can contribute sellers. So now you can be on a social media buying application, placing an order, being served by a seller that's sitting on an accounting software company, and they're all interconnected. And similarly, logistics companies will be available to deliver those goods. So with this, now you're able to create a crowdsourced network of buyers and sellers that transcends categories and domains. So today, we are used to buying specialist things in specialist places. Today, if I go on a holiday, I'm booking my flight tickets on one application, I'm booking my hotel on a different application, and I'm booking my taxi to the airport on a third application and maybe other services on something else. Right? So we are doing different things in different places. But once all products and services are available on single protocol, a holiday will be adding a flight ticket to cart, adding a hotel to cart, adding a taxi ride to cart, and maybe adding guide services at the destination into the cart, checking out and being done. And so that's what the value chain shift is going to take place courtesy ONDC, which is to create a protocol that allows large and small sellers to sit alongside each other. Think about open networks. When we make a choice of our browser, we don't necessarily choose the world's largest browser, and it does not matter. When we open a bank account, we don't necessarily choose the world's largest bank to open an account, because it does not matter. In e-commerce, it had begun to matter. But in an open network, where buyers and sellers are all connected to each other, regardless, pretty much like browsers and websites, then it does not matter. You do not have to join the largest party. The largest party cannot use their scale to extract additional value. And that really democratizes and allows reach of e-commerce. So that, in a nutshell, is what the story of ONDC is. Uh, we've begun. Uh, we went live about a year ago. We are now having at least one seller in 175 cities. We have more than 25,000 sellers across four domains, and more and more are beginning to join. Some of the large e-commerce marketplaces have also made their first move. A large uh, apparel uh, e-commerce marketplace is on the network. Two large paying applications are on the network as buyer applications. Uh, we have original manufacturers, companies with their own brands coming on board as sellers. So a lot of them were struggling with their D2C marketplaces. They now find it uh, makes sense to join a, a network such as this. And so with time, with support, we expect this to go big, not just for domestic transactions, but internationally as well. So we're looking at export legs as well. And as with everything else, there is only one protocol for anything in the world. Globally for internet, there is only one HTTP. Globally for email, there is only one SMTP. 
And so we expect that if we do well with this, then there will be only one protocol worldwide for e-commerce, and that may be ONDC. Thank you. In my opening remarks, I, I used some very ambitious, aspirational words like democratized, diverse, responsible, uh, inclusive supply chains or value chains. Uh, and you have shown us, sir, a very good example of how that can be done uh, in a far, far better, far faster, far more inclusive manner. So uh, congratulations, and I would say wish ONDC all the very best. And I'm sure next year when we meet, or you know, in a few months like this, uh, we will see the results of that already bearing fruit. Uh, let me now move to our guest from Denmark, uh, Mr. Frederick Andren Sandberg. Yeah. Uh, he's the head of public affairs for Vestas Wind Systems. So let's get some fresh wind <laughs> into our discussion. Thank you. Am I just taking sitting here if it's all right with you? So thank you so much. Um, really interesting uh, perspective from the uh, former panelists. I think the most interesting perspective was actually that you compared your own marriage to a trade deal. I found that uh, fascinating. I need to bring that home somehow. That's why I'm divorced. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but just to, to take some stock of who we are. So we are a wind turbine manufacturer. Um, I think many of you know that. And we actually had a few very turbulent years. So it, it of course, started with COVID. Uh, we thought that we had a really good global footprint. We were quite proud of our footprint. We, know, we thought we know what we were doing. And then all of a sudden, we couldn't really import from where we wanted to import from. We couldn't export from where we wanted to export from and so on. We know that transport costs went up, I think it was tenfold or, or, uh, or something like, like that in a year. Uh, so that hit us quite, quite severely. And then the second thing that happened was, of course, the um, uh, geopolitical shock in Europe just over a year ago, where uh, overnight we used to have factories in Russia. We used to import uh, steel from Ukraine. Now, we don't have factories in Russia, and we don't import steel from, from the Ukraine. And I think these sort of shocks really uh, rattle ourselves a little bit on how we thought about supply chains. Uh, and we realized that the market is really good on being, um, how do I say, rational in terms of where should we put our supply chain. But they're not strategic, they're tactical. So they don't really, really take any long-term term, uh, term consideration into account. And then I think a, uh, there was also a, a uh, heightened realization also in Europe that um, uh, because there were, we were, of course, in Europe very dependent on uh, energy coming out of, out of Russia. And now they are replacing that reliance. And then the question is that uh, how, what do, will they replace that with? And of course, they want to replace that with renewable energy. But then the question is what kind of supply chain will that renewable energy um, contain. So can we trust these supply chain? Are they sustainable in the, in the long, long run? Um, and then I think the, uh, the last shock was actually what happened just a, a few months ago, um, or mid, mid last year, and that was when the uh, US reacted quite heavily against this. So um, we've been all quite used to free trade in the past, but then the biggest grill in the room, the US, they simply threw free trade out of the window, and they said that now we're going to pr pursue a active industrial policy. And this being our biggest market also had quite hard repercussion for us. So we need to rethink on, on how we set, set ourselves up. And then the final thing is that we're now seeing such a huge demand increase, both from Europe, from uh, US, from APAC markets and, and elsewhere, that we're really trying to figure out now how can we actually cater for this demand. We, we heard the last panel saying that they need hundreds of gigawatts of uh, hydrogen electrolyzers. They need uh, hundreds of gigawatts of solar panels for uh, faraway markets and so on. And we're really struggling to figure out how to be able to supply that. Um, and one thing we realize now, as you also said, this uh, China plus one policy is that we cannot really put all the eggs in the same basket. We need to have resilience in our supply chain. We cannot only have all of our key components kind of coming out of one market. That is, of course, why we also have a huge setup here in India. We have uh, 3,700 colleagues here, and we're also um, producing turbines here. Um, but we are seeing a trend also where we want to have the production of our products being closer to the markets where they are being used. And uh, in case for India right now, we're not really selling that much turbines in India. It is mostly for, for exports. And uh, all the markets where we are now selling in, they are modeling local content, content requirements because they want to have secure value chains. Um, so I think that is actually our perspective on uh, what is happening now on global supply chain. So we think that they're going to be more regionalized for some components. Uh, they're going to be globalized for some other components. But it's going to be far more redundancy. 
so we're not going to just source out of one country. We're going to have multiple sources for, for each and every one of our different mod modules to build more resilience and be able to scale up for the, for the future. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Frederick. I think if my memory serves my right, many years ago it was in the same room that I heard uh, Thomas Friedman uh, when he had written the book about the world is flat. Uh, and it was a fascinating idea at that point of time. Uh, so it's only ironical that I hear from you today that it's not so flat anymore. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and we need to rethink, recalibrate the whole value chain. Uh, thank you for putting a very practical aspect to what we've been discussing. It's now my turn to uh, invite Mr. Piyush Kumar for his special address. Mr. Piyush Kumar, as I said, is the additional secretary in the Department of Commerce uh, and is somebody who the Indian industry relies on very heavily uh, for great policy measures. <coughs> uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, dignities on the dais and uh, distinguished guests here. Uh, very warm welcome and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be in the, uh, you know, speaking to you in this uh, uh, conference, the CIA India Europe Business and Sustainability Conclave uh, this afternoon. Uh, from the Ministry of uh, Commerce, uh, Department of Commerce, we are very excited about uh, this uh, conclave because it has come up at an opportune time when we are, you know, uh, very closely working uh, with, with the EU, with UK on the FTA side and uh, discussions such as these uh, really help us in shaping the, those discussions. And uh, especially I'd like to compliment uh, uh, the organizers for the, the panel that has been, uh, you know, formed here. We have, uh, you know, ONDC, uh, the Open Network uh, Digital Conference, and then uh, the, the space and uh, uh, the active areas where we were looking at uh, cooperation between India and Euro European side. Uh, let me take uh, uh, a moment of time to just give you the context of the, uh, you know, the, the FTA that, that we are looking uh, between India and EU uh, in this context. Uh, as we know, uh, you know, in the last few years, uh, the, the trade, it has been a very uncertain world uh, in terms of trade. Uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, Russia-Ukraine conflicts, uh, crumbling multilateral systems, uh, scarcity on food and energy goods, geopolitical uncertainties and uh, the pandemic induced uh, recession and trade winds. These are the uncertainties in which we, we find the, the trade today. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, there is a room for uh, uh, countries to align with like-minded uh, partners to forge uh, better alliances and safeguard the supply chain uh, shocks and the, uh, you know, and build up resilience. Uh, fortunately, global trade is also uh, brightening up. Uh, latest WTO update is upbeat about the, the global trade. Despite devastations, uh, the trade uh, uh, flows or routes continue to be open. WTO notes uh, the economy is greatly affected uh, you know, by the Ukraine war, found alternatives, uh, uh, alternative source of supply. And uh, uh, you know, it has been confirmed that 4% year-on-year growth on the intermediate goods uh, in the second quarter of uh, uh, FY 2022 uh, is, is a positive sign. In this context, uh, India-European EU relationship uh, you know, can, can be very, very productive. Uh, in a uh, rapidly changing global world order, India and EU offer common interests in terms of uh, uh, you know, security, prosperity, and sustainable development uh, based on resilient uh, value chains. Uh, together between uh, India and EU, uh, we represent a GDP of uh, nearly about $24 trillion and a combined population of more than 2.5 uh, uh, billion uh, people. So uh, building a sustainable and resilient uh, economic partnership uh, can significantly uh, drive not only trade between these two countries but for the global order itself. Uh, there are many opportunities for the businesses around in India and Europe to uh, work together. Uh, I believe the policy team initiatives will drive this uh, uh, sustainable and economic uh, growth on, the, on both sides. So it is in this context, you know, realizing the, the importance of it, uh, recently uh, Trade and Technology Council uh, has been uh, reinitiated after, uh, you know, the, the uh, visit of uh, European President and uh, Prime Minister Nareen Modi's uh, uh, meeting. In April 22, we had restored uh, the uh, uh, Trade and Technolo uh, uh, Technology Council. 
uh, under the uh, uh, TTC, the Trade Technology Council, we are looking at three uh, working groups uh, to be working on strategic technologies, green and clean energy technologies, as well as uh, trade and uh, investment uh, resilient value chains. On the trade working group side, uh, uh, you know, uh, resilient supply chain access to uh, critical components uh, uh, for energy and raw materials uh, is, is the core, uh, the four area that, that uh, we are working we're working on. Under the uh, working group is strategic uh, technology, we resolve to work together in areas like digital and uh, governance and digital connectivities, artificial intelligence, 5G and uh, 6G quantum computing, semiconductors, cloud systems, cyber securities. Uh, so there are immense uh, you know, opportunities that uh, uh, both these sectors provide. Uh, if you were to look at uh, the, the, you know, what uh, Indian ecosystem today uh, provides, uh, um, you know, they, they, we have a great opportunity today in terms of innovative capacities, uh, you know, as uh, demonstrated uh, by the pandemic uh, resident, where almost seventh of the world's population, we could, uh, we could, uh, you know, move very swiftly and we could provide uh, uh, in terms of uh, vaccines, in terms of our uh, manufacturing facilities aligned to the uh, pandemic response, as well as, uh, you know, uh, uh, effective use of digital tools uh, to, uh, um, uh, to develop, uh, uh, you know, systems to track and trace the, uh, the, the virus and its, its spread. So these were very uh, successful uh, models that, that we had adopted as in our fight to, uh, with the, uh, in the pandemic times. As we embark upon this journey of the FTAs, you know, India is looking at uh, uh, trade negotiation, trade partnership with key partners. Uh, we have signed FTAs with uh, UAE, Australia, and currently we are, uh, you know, uh, deeply engaged with uh, European Union as well as uh, UK and Canada. Uh, this, uh, you know, the relaunching of this FTA talk after a gap of nine years shows the, uh, the need on the both sides to, to have a, a greater uh, collaboration. In terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, European Union's investment in India has been one of the, one of the largest uh, in last two years, that is between April 20 uh, to uh, July 22. Uh, there was almost uh, nearly 100 billion of investment coming from the European side. And Indian uh, diaspora also had an investment of about almost about 40 uh, billion dollars in, <coughs> in, the, in the corresponding period. Today, the IT revolution uh, provides a unique uh, opportunity in India with uh, nearly 1.4 billion people connected with the inter uh, internet. Uh, digital mission uh, has fluid ways for a uh, major uh, rapid technological uh, you know, advances in the, in the country. There is a high potential to collaborate on services space between India and uh, Europe in, in the digital uh, field itself. <coughs> India can also, uh, we can deepen global value chain transformations through a greater participation of small enterprises in terms of quality and competitiveness of our MSME and access to finance is one area where a greater collaboration can really help and unleash a lot of potential uh, in, in this area. Similarly, uh, supporting uh, businesses by integrating in the global value chain and regional value chain uh, as a part of the you know, China Plus strategy that we, were talk we have been talking about. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, India provides that opportunity uh, by using the, uh, technologies like the open network uh, digital commerce ONDC uh, platform which was just talked about. Similarly, uh, today uh, we are working on you know, uh, key sectors uh, by providing incentives in terms of uh, PLI schemes, the productive, uh, production linked incentive schemes in as many as uh, uh, 14 sectors and the key sectors being uh, bulk drugs, medical uh, devices, telecom, white goods uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, food processing uh, which we would like uh, to be uh, made globally uh, competitive uh, and uh, attract investment in, in these sectors. So, Similarly, PLA also aims at uh, integral and reliable part of, you know, uh, to, uh, to make it an integral part of the global value chain. Uh, I also need to mention here that, uh, you know, startups has been something which in India we have been uh, uh, witnessing impressive gains last, uh, you know, in the, in, in the year uh, uh, to 2021, there were 44 unicorns created and 20 in the same period, uh, same period last year, 22, and over 85,000 uh, uh, you know, starts up have been registered in the uh, Startup India uh, portal. These are uh, newer sectors and newer geographies which are expanding because of the, the opportunity that, that has been paved by uh, the technological advances that, that we have had. 
Similarly, uh, uh, climate change mitigation is a national priority, uh, which is of great concern to us because, uh, as a uh, you know, as a poor country, we need to be the impact, the social impact of the environment changes are very many manifold in India. Uh, therefore, we have been working on uh, you know electric mobility uh, policies. We have also been uh, looking at. Uh, forming, uh, expanding our market in terms of electrical vehicles, both for the, uh, you know, the, the regular uh, four-wheelers and the two-wheeler vehicle system. The charging infrastructure uh, is something that uh, in India we are, we are developing in a, in a great way and a lot of investment in these sectors also we are looking at. Uh, now, therefore, uh, the specific areas of uh, you know, coordination, if we look at uh, cooperation between India and Europe, if we were to look at, uh, one would be the sister ports agreement, because port is uh, a technology which uh, you know, in Europe has been developed well, and India uh, needs uh, you know, a, a, a partnership, both in terms of investment and uh, technology transfer in this, in this sector. Similarly, logistics corridors is something uh, we have been uh, working on. Uh, multimodal logistic park uh, MMLP is part of the Gati Shakti, PM Gati Shakti program where a uh, lot of flip has been uh, given and we, we are keenly working on, uh, on the, those areas, especially national infrastructure pipeline where we have a huge requirement of investment. Uh, we are over a period of uh, five years looking at uh, something like $1.4 trillion of investment uh, to be taken up in this uh, period. Uh, we are halfway through and uh, till 25, uh, another two years, we are looking at uh, a major investment. Similarly, we are also looking at monetization, monetization of some of uh, our assets, uh, which would, could bring in some efficiencies and in terms of investments. So these are the potential areas where I think as part of the uh, negotiation as we go along, uh, there is a great value uh, that both sides can, can bring. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know opportunities for trade and op uh, 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 um, uh, prosperity for both sides. Uh, in this context, I also need to mention that uh, in the G G20 presidency, uh, you know the uh, the theme of Vasudev Kutumbam, uh, Kutumbkam, one earth, one family, and one future is what uh, we have adopted as uh, you know uh, a, a key area creating harmony uh, for uh, for uh, uh, better lives of the of the people across the globe. This reflects also the uh, you know uh, uh, international collaborative approach efforts that are required to meet the global challenges. Uh, no single entity uh, can achieve this uh, the kind of progress which you know in in trade and sustainability in areas like trade innovation and sustainability. Uh, we need to work together to bring in uh, those efficiencies. And uh, it is again in this context of G20 and the FTAs that we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, platforms like this where business and, uh, you know, uh, uh, of both sides can come together uh, and, uh, and work in a close co partnership, close coordination will also give us uh, key uh, insights into how, uh, you know, our, uh, our negotiations or discussions on the uh, trade agreement can also, uh, also progress. Uh, therefore, we keenly look upon the, uh, you know, the deliberations that uh, in this two days workshop will be happening. Uh, to, today and tomorrow's all the sessions are fairly impressive and we will go through uh, you know the, the points that come in, come in uh, for uh, to guide us in our, our discussions on the FTA. Once again I'd like to compliment all the, uh, the organizers and we look forward for the outcome of this uh, discussion. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much uh, Piyush Kumarji for walking us through uh, this, this FTA as you rightly said nine years in the making now and also uh, I'm sure the 140 billion dollar 100 plus 40 cross-border investment I'm sure the government is aiming at at least doubling that within the next few years so if we have time at the end I'm sure we'll get a few questions uh, it's my uh, privilege now to invite uh, His Excellency Mr. Karolis Zemaitis uh, for the keynote address please Hello, everyone. Yes, as a politician, you know, I will use the, the, the tribune, of course. Uh, but um, so uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, distinguished participants, guests, ladies and gentlemen. This is my great honor to be here and to represent Lithuania as well as European Union, as well as the European dimension in this very important dialogue. And let me allow me to begin with a quotation from one of the economic textbooks that I like to read for my 
Daughter by Lewis Carroll, Alice in the Wonderland, which I think very well describes the current reality we live in. And the quote is that sometimes you have to run very fast to remain in the same position. And I think this very well describes the current reality we live in when everyone tries and wants to run as fast as possible. And, uh, and of course, this is something that we discuss a lot also here in New Delhi, and it's my pleasure to be present here and be part of this India-Europe business and sustainability conclave. And I'm also very excited and, and uh, to see a lot of our Nordic and Scandinavian friends as well, and a lot of clients also uh, from, from Denmark and Sweden. So we are very happy to, to be here. On the other hand, we fully understand that we live in very volatile times. And recent global crises have shown that the global supply chains are not as resistant as we have thought. And also we are constantly reminded that excessive dependencies on single supplier are not just harmful for global uh, value chains, it's also a security issue. You know, sometimes the baskets that we put all our eggs you know, are, 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 are a bit complicated. And now I think everyone is more or less understanding that. Lithuania became, itself became a textbook case for economic coercion, for the democratic choices Lithuania made, for defending human rights and human values. And Lithuania better than anyone understands the value of the value chains and, uh, and the value of partnerships and, and partnerships between reliable, predictable and democratic countries. So for us it is uh, more than clear uh, on which part of history we're standing and that's why international partnerships right now are as vital as, uh, as ever and, um, and of course Europe uh, as well as the whole world is in experiencing the global transition. And uh, EU has an ambition to become climate neutral continent by 2050. And we will not achieve that by fancy speeches, by, by fancy politicians, but by actual actions that will trigger that uh, progress. The same goes with India, which is very actively working in the green transition initiatives. And I think this is one of the areas when everyone suddenly became environmentalists, you know, with, with the current energy prices and with the current, you know, energy issues, everyone started to become, uh, become you know, a climate change activist and we are very happy about it, finally, you know, and uh, of course uh, it's better later than, uh, than never. And uh, in this case, you know, in the value scale we really believe that EU and India are, are like-minded um, continents, countries and partners. And, uh, EU and India are the largest democracies in the world and we, have to, we don't have to forget that. And we share commitment on rules-based global order, sustainable development and open trade. Unfortunately, Russia's war against Ukraine threatens the international rules-based order which ensures equal sovereignty to all states. Uh, we have many other challenges globally as well and many of them have been discussed also today and, and in other formats. And uh, India is an important trade and investment partner for Europe, that's, uh, that's for sure. We have a lot of uh, European businesses already present in India, a lot of Indian businesses already present in Europe and I think we are right now creating a bridge uh, that has to be sustainable, that has to ensure, you know, that it is a two-way street, you know, that this is a, not a zero-sum game for, for any of the parties. This is a two-way street where both, uh, both sides actually benefit and co-create uh, the, the success. And when it comes to the global value chains, of course, India's and EU free trade agreement is crucial and critical. And we uh, really... Um, believe that this is something that could boost our cooperation even more and that could boost uh, our bilateral uh, trade and, and working together. Of course we have the cooperation formats like EU India Trade and Technology Council and many other European uh, formats when we discuss uh, how we proceed further. When it comes to Lithuania uh, it is important you know that uh, to that diversification is critical for us and uh, I would have to say that this is, might be, sound like a paradox, but in my opinion, you know, the Nordic Baltic region is stronger than ever, despite all these challenges that we have right now. And uh, even though last year we had war, we had energy challenges, inflation, and many other you know, supply uh, chain challenges, still Lithuania managed to have the record-breaking year in FDI attraction. 
And uh, this was, you know, for me as the Minister of Economy and Innovation, this is something very, that I, this is the number that I follow very closely, and I was, honestly, I was positively surprised by that number, because I was not expecting such a good number, which shows the resilience and the trust of investment and investors uh, to the region. And, uh, of course, we, the priority of the Lithuanian government is uh, new, re reliable, and um, partners. And in many cases, you know, in recent years, we've been discussing about offshoring, you know, nearshoring. But I think now, more and more, we are discussing about ally shoring, you know. Because in some cases, it doesn't matter how far away a certain uh, factory is. Sometimes it's not even matter what, is, what are the labor costs. The question is, is your partner predictable? Does your partner uh, respect IP? rule of law, human rights, forced labor issues. These are the questions that are raised, you know, not only by some act NGO activists. These are the questions that are raised by the businesses themselves because everyone started to calculate that these things matter not only in fancy presentations but also in Excel sheets. When you suddenly un understand that, you know, uh, your business, you are, you know, you are pushed out of business because of these challenges. And we see the cooperation and partnership with India primarily in the object, in the, in the fields of high-tech engineering, ICT, life sciences. This is the main topics that we as the country are focusing. And I know that, you know, as well as our Nordic friends are also focusing on high-value added industries. And, um, and just, for you to, just for you to know, Lithuania already had, uh, has three unicorns and that's for three million population, that's you know, one unicorn per million. In Indian uh, parallel, that would be 1,500 unicorns. You know. So I think you know, we are on a very good track. I have to tell for our Danish friends that if your uh, Danske Bank app is not working, you have to blame the Lithuanians because we are the ones who are covering the IT for you. The same I can tell for the Swedish colleagues for the Swedbank and SEB because all the major Scandinavian banking IT operations are covered in Lithuania. And for the Indian colleagues, I can tell you know, if the Scandinavians are trusting their money IT, why not the Indian ones as well? So also, when it comes to ICT, Lithuania is one of the highest digitally advanced countries in the world. The same goes with uh, life sciences, the same goes with high-tech engineering. We have one strong Lithuanian company already present in India, uh, which uh, it's Teltonica, it's IoT manufacturer, and actually in January the company signed a historic agreement with our Taiwanese colleagues regarding the semiconductor manufacturing, and this is the same company that is operating in Lithuania, has also a facility in, in India, and we really see Lithuania and India working together bilaterally and also working on the European basis as well, because, uh, you know, this is something, these are the areas where we are focusing a lot, as well as we, our Indian friends might know this uh, uh, project called Adhar, the ID, the digital ID uh, project, the historical, you know, unprecedented project of Indian, um, bio, Indian certification for, for biometric ID, and Lithu one of Lithuanian companies is also part of this uncomprehendable project that is happening in India. And, of course, we have some, uh, some Indian businesses in Lithuania, such as HCL, Indorama, and others. But uh, for us, you know, it is important to highlight, and I'm, I'm going to the concluding remarks, that we want to, you know, to find these value chains, you know, res uh, resilient and reliable. And here, that is why, you know, I think the European interest in the Indo-Pacific region is present. That's why we are here, that's why there will be more delegations from Scandinavia, from European Union, from Baltic region coming to India and looking for the ways how we could work together. And uh, when we discuss, you know, free trade, I really, really invite you that we don't trade in human rights, rule of law, and democracy. And let's run as fast as we can to keep moving forward. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Excellency. Excellent. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you covered a lot of ground, and I don't attempt to, to summarize that. Uh, but I was really, um, I would say, very, very impressed uh, with some of the remarks you made. And I, I follow a guru called Goldratt, an uh, Israeli gentleman who unfortunately passed away. And he said very, very simply, 
uh, tell me how you'll measure me and I'll tell you how I behave. And I think what you're saying is if companies and countries begin to be measured in different ways and not trading in human rights uh, uh, or forced labor, it will change the paradigm of what we call global value chains and where they get established. Thank you very much for your insights. Uh, on, on the partnership, sir, I'm reminded, and you talked extensively about the FTA, and, uh, and this is something where uh, I remember my, my son uh, was reading a book called, uh, on negotiation called Never Settle Halfway, and I said, what does this say? Uh, so he said, of course, it was an American author, and he said, you know, anybody can settle halfway. Uh, so don't be satisfied with halfway unless you get a little more than that. And I said, yeah, good luck to you, and hope that the guy on the other end has not read the same book, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, but I was trying to sort of steer him in the way, and in India we follow a lot of, you mentioned Vasudeva, but, but Kutukunumbukam, uh, nature as a great uh, teacher, and nothing in nature actually exists for itself. I mean, a mango tree doesn't eat its own mangoes, right? I mean, a river doesn't drink its own water. Uh, we human beings, however, you know, in, in all humility, but we are conscious beings, but we always seek. Uh, in any negotiation, we don't ask ourselves, and, and, and that for many years as a businessman I practiced, very successfully, in every negotiation, I ask myself, what can I give this lady or gentleman who's coming to negotiate with me today? What is it that I can give her? And if that becomes clear, I somehow mystically find that the other person begins to look at my interests in that whole discussion. And we've always had a win-win as a very small company. I have seven joint ventures now uh, with different parts of the world. And all of them work very smoothly just because we are basing it on this very one fundamental. So I think the previous GVCs were settled on the winner-takes-all, zero-sum game uh, that was played out. And I just hope that we learn from those mistakes and never let that happen again. Uh, with that, I don't think we have any time for, I get some indications from the organizer that we are bang on time. So if not for the quality of discussions, I'm sure we can be congratulated for landing on time. Uh, so, uh, but I must say, thank you very much to all our distinguished panelists this evening. It's been a pleasure for me to moderate this, and I hope it's been a pleasure for the audience to listen to us. Thank you. Thank you very We're going to start with the next session right away. So I'd like to thank Mr. Sharma, the chair, and everybody for this delightful session, which just has concluded. We will begin with the next session as soon as we've turned the top table around, and we'll be ready.
get them started. Yeah. Okay, so now we're ready to start with the session. May I request everyone to please sit down? Everybody near the door, please request you all to take a seat. And we're now ready to start over the, the session, and I hand the session over to Manisha from PNB Pariva, and she'll take over. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the final session of day one of the India-Europe Sustainability Conclave, which is on the topic Business of Sustainability. To kick off the session, we have with us Mr. Sanjay Singh, Chief Executive Officer and Head of Territory for BNP Pariva India. A veteran of the banking and financial markets, Sanjay's previous positions in the group have been that of Head of Global Markets, as well as CEO of BNP Paribas Securities India. As Head of Territory, Sanjay is responsible for the group's strategy in the country, local governance, and deepening our initiatives related to CSR and promoting sustainable finance. May I invite Mr. Singh on the stage, please? Thank you, Manisha, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to take this opportunity to speak in this forum uh, for the BNP Paribas activities in, in India, as well as the global context on the subject which we are taking up today here. If I'll talk about the BNP Paribas first, what globally we are doing. So particularly, we are the European Union's leading bank and the key player in international banking arena. Uh, with revenue of Euro 50.1 billion as for, for CY 2022. Uh, the bank has a presence in more than 65 countries across the five continents with more than 195,000 employees. BNP Parba mission is to contribute to responsible and sustainable economy by financing and advising clients according to the highest ethical standards. What is the group is doing in the sustainable area? BNP Paribas is the number one worldwide with 19.5 billion euro green bonds as per the Bloomberg data. And world's top bank in sustainable finance in 2022 as per euro money latest data. Three main pillars, aligning our portfolios with carbon and neutrality commitment a company clients transition towards a sustainable and low carbon economy, strengthening expertise, stirring tools and processes. The GTS plan announced by the bank has set the ambitious 2025 decarbonization target for power, oil and gas and automotive with the full range of solutions to accompany our clients in their net zero transition journey. If I'll take up about the BNP Parva India, journey and what we are doing in the sustainable area. Our presence in India more than 160 years, to be exact, maybe 163 years, more than 15,000 employees in India, uh, which is 8% of our total workforce for BNP Paribas, offering the full range of corporate and institutional banking, institutional broking, retail broking, and asset management services. Presence of global capacity, Caters, centers supporting BNP Paribas entities across 30 countries, named BNP Paribas Inter International Corporate Bank, best international corporate bank in India by Asia Money in 2022. Our journey as a BNP Paribas India in the sustainable way, as part of the group's GTS 2025 plan, India continues to build on various initiatives, be it on the product offerings, services, our advisory, we offer the following products, solutions to clients in India. If you look at about the liability side, we do offer green and sustainable deposits. If you look at the asset side, green loans, project finance, LT finance, sustainability linked loans, sustainability bond, green bank guarantee issuance, 
on advisory side, MNA as well as low carbon transitioning. It very important to mention here in this forum, uh, of course, uh, about the sustainability last three, four years, uh, post-COVID particularly, it's evolved in the country and uh, most of the corporate and uh, across country people are getting the awareness and doing it. I must say BNP Parva is the first bank who started this journey almost 10 years back and we are the only bank who started the Global Sustainable Forum in, in Singapore in 2013-14 and there almost every year globally we see more than 1000 clients travel across the world to the Singapore to attend the BNP Paribas Sustainable Forum. During the COVID time, also we tried to do this forum through online rather than the physical presence. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, we'll now kick off our panel, and for that, may I invite our distinguished guest. Um, Mr. Sandeep Chakravarti, Joint Secretary, Europe West Ministry of External Affairs. Sir, could you please come up on the stage? Uh, may I also request Ms. Vaishali Nigam Sinha, Chief Sustainability Officer, Renew Power and Chair of the Renew Foundation. Mr. Sanjay Kanwar, Managing Director, Yara Fertilizers India. Mr. Sanjay Agarwal, Managing Director, Fortum Group and Chairperson, FinCham India. Mr. Arnab Roy, CFO, Managing Director and CEO, Schneider Electric Group, India. And also my colleague, who will be the moderator and chair for the session, Ms. Dilkush Cooper, who is the Head of Business Development and Strategy, BNP Paribas, India. Good evening, um, everyone. Uh, uh, so the topic is business of uh, sustainability and uh, you know we, you heard Sanjay just a few minutes ago and sustainability is at the heart of uh, BNP. It's one of the pillars of our ambition and uh, we are, uh, every, every region is working towards it. We work very closely with our clients um, on their sustainability agenda as well. And as we heard this morning as well, you know when, when the, the speakers from the government were also here, it's not just the government which speaks about sustainability, but it's also a corporate responsibility. And that's something that we will discuss on the panel here today. Um, to start with, I will give, uh, whilst Manisha has introduced the panel briefly, I'll give more details on each one of them. Uh, Mr. Sandeep Chakravarti, Joint Secretary, Europe West, at the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. He is responsible for the bilateral relationship with 13 nations in Europe. Uh, Mr. Chakravarti has held multiple positions in the diplomatic service since 1996. He holds a master's degree in advanced studies in international and European security from Geneva University, a master's degree in sociology, and he is also a postgraduate in forestry management. Mr. Chakravarti has strong interest and involvement in conservation and sustainability issues, and in his current assignment, he is working on obtaining greater European presence in the Indo-Pacific and uh, on strong green and sustainable partnerships with Europe. So thank you for being here, Mr. Chakravarti. Uh, Sanjeev Kanwar, Country Manager, South Asia, Yara Fertilizers, India Private Limited. Sanjeev is the Country Manager, South Asia for Yara uh, since its inception in 2011. Yara India is a 100% subsidiary of Yara International ASA Oslo. Uh, under his leadership, Yara has expanded its operations to over 15 states in India and has built a leading position in the horticultural segment in the country. Sanjeev was instrumental in acquiring Tata Chemicals Urea business for um, USD 421 million and becoming the first foreign MNC to invest in the Indian fertilizer sector. Before joining Yara, Sanjeev had worked in various capacities in Norsk Hydro, Sabic, uh, Indo Gulf Fertilizers, and PT Indo Bharat Rayon Jakarta. Sanjeev has 35 plus years of professional experience in the fertilizer and agricultural sector, and he works closely with various industry associations and is on the board of Fertilizer Association of India. Vaishali Nigam Sinha, co founder and chairperson Sustainability Renew. Uh, Vaishali drives the company's corporate social responsibility and sustainability agenda. 
Over years, Vaishali has strategically advanced causes such as climate action, sustainability development, and equal participation of women in the economy. Programs led by Vaishali have impacted more than 6.5 million lives across 250 villages in India. Vaishali is President's invitee to Columbia World Projects at Columbia University, created to tackle major global challenges. She serves on the President's Advisory Council at Wellesley College and the Columbia Global Center's Mumbai Advisory Board. She's also a member of the World Economic Forum South Asia Regional Action, Green Working Group of the Energy Transition Task Force of Sustainable Markets Initiative, and the Global Alliance for Sustainable Energy. Vaishali is on the board of the UN Global Compact Network India and chairperson of the Agenda Committee, senior advisor to the WEF Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders. Sanjay Agarwal, President Fortum India and chairman of Finland Chamber of Commerce in India. Um, Fortum India is engaged in solar, bioethanol, and charging infrastructure of e for EV business. Fortum has invested in 700 megawatt of solar projects till date and is on track to develop over 2.5 gigawatt in partnership with Actis Fund in the next three years. Fortum is also setting up Assam Bio Refinery, which is a joint venture with Numaligar Refinery Limited for building a bio refinery in Assam that aims at converting bamboo into ethanol the first of its kind in the world. Fortum's charge and drive segment in partnership with FinFun responds to an increasing demand in e-mobility by providing turnkey solutions for B2B and B2B, B2C, creating public charging network and providing world-class cloud solutions. Fortum is rolling out charging infrastructure with 1,000 points this year in over 18 cities across India. With 36 years in the energy sector, Sanjay brings with him all-round expertise in project development, management and execution, marketing, project and structured finance, asset management services, operations and creating new businesses. Sanjay began his career with Tata Motors and commanded leadership positions with Thermax, ABB, Watsila and Tata Power before joining Fortum in 2014. And last but not the least, uh, Arnab Roy. Arnab is the CFO uh, Schneider Electric, um, in Group CFO for Schneider Electric India for the Greater India Zone, covering over 12 entities of the group. Arnab has over 25 years of professional experience, primarily with US, British, and French MNCs, handling finance, uh, accounts, tax, operations, supply chain, HR, IT, admin, and regulatory issues. He has been CFO for the last 14 years with US and European MNCs. Before joining Schneider, Arnab has worked in leadership roles with organizations like GE, Tyco Healthcare, G4S, Herbalife, and Tata's. Arnab is passionate about sustainability and is instrumental in adopting sustainable practices across the Schneider Electric Group. He is an economics graduate and a professional accountant by profession and an alumnus of IIM Bangalore. So yes, these uh, introductions were a little lengthy, but uh, we were keen that you know um, a little bit more about each of these uh, panelists today. And with that, um, I, we, will, we will deep dive into, into the questions. Um, so Mr. Sandeep Chakravarti, the first one is for you. Um, in, in a recent survey conducted by Frost and Sullivan, um, most of the Indian companies surveyed have stated that sustainability is part of their leadership's formal agenda, their strategic vision, uh, and, and a company goal, and that government support would be a major driver in accelerating the pivot to sustainability. What are some of the key initiatives and projects that the government and regulators have prioritized to facilitate and catalyze actions towards decarbonization? If we could get your views on that. Thank you uh, for the question. I was expecting a kind of an out of syllabus question, but <laughs> I think I'm prepared to answer this. But before I get into your question, I would, uh, since I belong to the Minister of External Affairs, I would just uh, try to give a framework of where, uh, uh, where we fit in and where uh, the government fits in. Uh, as I see it, there are three um, pillars or three elements of uh, uh, this whole sustainability climate change uh, debate. And uh, one is, of course, what India does internally. 
um, for its own people, as our Prime Minister said, you know, India uh, is meeting its climate um, commitments, not for the world as such, but for our own people. It's for our own good. And we have to do it for our own uh, people. So, uh, so government rolls out a set of policies, and I'll get uh, into that uh, later. Then we have an international dimension, which is um, our commitment uh, internationally to the UNFCC. Uh, you know, we, we started with the Paris Accord, the, our NDC commitments, and, uh, and uh, with the Glasgow, we have the new NDC commitments. And in uh, Sharm El Sheikh, we gave our LTLED as the long-term low emission development strategy. So that is an international commitment. And the third element in which uh, Minister of External Affairs and uh, at least I have a role is, is how to channelize international cooperation uh, in meeting our uh, domestic requirements and also uh, as a result uh, or consequentially address our international commitments. So on, on these three pillars actually government is working and your question uh, has a very strong domestic element but also you know it is influenced by what is happening uh, around the world and it is also influenced by our development partners people with whom uh, we, we talk on a regular basis. For instance, uh, just last uh, weekend we had uh, Chancellor Scholz, the German Chancellor. And um, for Germany, climate, and, uh, climate change, sustainability is a major uh, international uh, issue. Uh, not international, even domestic. You know, uh, the Green Party is a major stakeholder in, in Germany. And in Germany there are four ministries which deal with climate. It is the Ministry of Economy and Climate Change. It is a Ministry of Cooperation and Climate Change. It is a Ministry of External Affairs and Climate Change. And there is a Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. So there are four entities in the government which deal with the issue of sustainability. And we have to engage with, with all of them. And uh, you know, in his talks with Prime Minister, there was climate was, was, was discussed. And uh, um, the G7 has come up with a, with a uh, concept called the Climate Club. And uh, they are very keen that India joins that Climate Club. So what I'm saying is that in our engage, and that sets in some ways, indirectly or directly, the agenda, the domestic agenda also, because you know we cannot uh, be seen not uh, honoring our international commitments. If you want me to specifically list out some of the things that um, we have done uh, with our foreign partners, uh, I would say that you know we are uh, playing a role in, in green financing. You know we are encouraging our companies to to raise money in in in, in Europe. Uh, you know uh, last year I believe we facilitated. State Bank of India raising green bonds in, in the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Uh, we are channelizing, um, you know, development cooperation uh, from Europe into India for, for uh, sustainability projects. Uh, we last year signed a uh, program called the GSDP, uh, Green and Sustainable Development Partnership Program with Germany, under which they committed $10 billion in seven years for uh, green projects. And similarly with the UK, with France and other development partners, uh, with the uh, with the EU, uh, we have Nina from the EIB. You know, their almost entire portfolio is is, is green and sustainable. So uh, th there is that is the role that that we play. But uh, domestically, the the, the, an the answer to your question is that you know there are many many uh, policy framework that um, I think is impulsing uh, change in India in and in towards green and sustainability. Some of which um, you know which come to my mind uh, is the National Hydrogen Mission. Uh, you know, hydrogen is now a buzzword, you know, in, I think how quickly uh, hydrogen has become part of our daily uh, parlance is, is quite amazing, you know, two years back uh, we didn't know about hydrogen, then, you know, increased use of biofuels, I think this ethanol blending is, is an amazing thing, you know, and every year I think we are increasing the ratio of ethanol, and that has uh, actually inculcated so much of, uh, you know, it has reinvented um, sugarcane cropping in India, you know, we were all worried what to do with sugarcane. And now sugarcane has become a lucrative crop because of ethanol blending. And then, you know, electric charging stations, uh, somebody mentioned, yes. you know, there is a national policy and we are incentivizing electric um, uh, charging station. Electric mobility, you know, our uh, partnerships with several countries in electric mobility. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to uh, say this, but, you know, when the Chancellor came, we were almost uh, about to announce a, a big project uh, between um, Volkswagen and Mahindra. On, 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 uh, on electric mobility, you know, huge investments from Volkswagen into electric vehicles of, of, of Mahindra. Then improving energy efficiency. Few years back, you saw this huge movement in, in changing our bulbs uh, from incandescent bulbs to LED. Again, that is government-driven. 
and now you know we have uh, solid manufacturing in in LEDs and then electric, uh, electri uh, railway electrification by 2030 railways have declared that they would be net zero I think Reliance has also declared it will be net zero I don't know by 2040 or something 2035 yeah. I was reading even uh, um, IOC in Indian Oil Corporation has declared I think 2047 or something as, as their net zero year. So I think, uh, you know, these, uh, our own net zero is 2070, but uh, I think many corporates and many um, uh, organizations in, in the country will, will be forced to declare net zero because unless you do that, you know, investors will not invest in them. Public opinion is very strong. You know, there is a strong uh, requirement of ESG compliance. So I think all in all, uh, government uh, is certainly in the business of sustainability and uh, if uh, we are setting the framework, I think businesses are the ones which will deliver. And, and I think uh, these kind of platforms are very important where, uh, you know, we, we talk uh, with businesses and understand uh, what we can do together. But I must say that uh, uh, sustainability and green agenda is very much our, as part of our foreign policy agenda and in every discussion uh, that uh, we are having, uh, we, we, we talk about it. Uh, in a few days' time, uh, we have the Italian Prime Minister. Uh, last year, Prime Minister, uh, when he had gone to Italy, uh, he announced a uh, strategic partnership on uh, energy transition. Uh, energy co companies of Italy, green companies, are, are having huge projects with Indian corporates in, in solar power, in blending of uh, um, hydrogen with, with uh, CNG. So uh, I think uh, the, it's a very exciting time. And I think uh, uh, you know, the, the framework that we are laying out, uh, the government domestically and through international cooperation, is actually energizing um, partnerships between Indian companies and foreign companies. Sure. No, thank you. I, I think um, we totally agree with you that whilst India has mentioned uh, 2070, even we in our interactions with our clients see a lot of clients already taking a lot of steps uh, towards achieving that goal much, much earlier. Um, and, and again, on this entire G20 presidency, as well as the B20 and the task force, the various task force identified there is climate change, there is sustainability, so that there are all those initiatives, again, which are being discussed, and a lot will come out of that as well, I suppose. So, um, a question for you, um, Arnab. Um, research shows that companies with high ESG ratings have a lower cost of debt and equity, and that sustainability initiatives can help improve financial performance while fostering public support. Schneider Electric has multiple listed companies in India and overseas, and uh, BNP, of course, has also worked with them on quite a few of the sustainability initiatives. In your view, how mature is this theme in India, and what can be done by stakeholders uh, banks, regulators, industry to expedite uh, the progress in India, similar to what Europe has achieved. A little bit uh, to elaborate over what uh, we just heard from uh, Mr. Chakravarti. Thanks for the question. I think for us in Schneider Electric, uh, the very purpose of our existence is sustainability. So that's the purpose of our organization. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We have been in the journey uh, globally for about 15 years now. And uh, by virtue of that, we have matured, uh, I mean, to an extent in this journey. It's obviously a learning. But to your specific question, I think uh, I mean, overall in India, when I look at it, and last two years, last five years, particularly I see that uh, the maturity of uh, uh, sustainability is now coming in. It's coming of age, you can say. And uh, there is a lot of awareness among various stakeholders. If you look at cross-sectional view, even the employees, they, are, they want to join a company which is more sustainable. Customers, they want to buy from an organization which is more sustainable. An organization like us, more than three-fourths of our revenue is green revenue, and we are very proud of that. But coming on to where various stakeholders can contribute, I think if you look into the scope three, where most of us are working at this stage, companies like us, we are also working on our scope four, which is on the customer side. This is where I think the entire value chain, the partnership can come in. And the way we look at sustainability, I mean, in our journey, is a combination of decarbonization and digitization. Both the components are important. The digitization component sometimes we underplay is very, very important in the whole journey. For example, if you look at the whole journey of supply chain finance, we are partnering today with various fintechs to ensure that depending on where our suppliers are, uh, are buying their entire supply chain from, or where some of our channel partners are selling their thing, what percentage of their revenue is green revenue. And accordingly, we give them a sustainability score. And then we are partnering with organizations to see how the sustainability score can then go, go into a financial score for them so that they get a preferential funding. 
most of the bankers we work with, they have uh, ESG dedicated fund, which is what Sanjay was also saying at the beginning of it. I think that part is coming of age. So sustainability, in my opinion, is going to be a key differentiator. And it's, it's, it's a good business. So if you look at it from any side, I mean, including the sustainability effort, the ROIs are pretty good. So as a CFO, I can tell you that it's a good business. Beyond everything, the, the social benefit, it's also a good business. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm certain, I'm sure you've incentivized a few corporates in the room uh, to look at it from that angle as well. Clearly, there is this consciousness on sustainability all around. Um, Vaishali, um, you know, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has committed to um, achieving net zero emissions by 2070, as we just even spoke about it. As part of the five-pronged um, commitment Panchamrit, he also um, outlined the target to produce 500 gigawatt of energy from non-fossil uh, sources by 2030 and reduce carbon intensity to 45%. Renew is one of the major companies in India working on that vision as well. What are the major roadblocks you foresee in achieving this vision? And how do you envisage to overcome these uh, challenges? Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, I also want to congratulate Mr. Chakravarti for you know, conceptualizing and implementing this very useful forum. I think, um, you know, before coming to roadblocks, which I find uh, they're important to identify, but I think we must really complement uh, the work which uh, uh, the Prime Minister has done in leading the way and showing a vision. I think uh, we've seen in other parts of the world where there is no vision and there is commitment. Uh, you know, things don't move as fast as they could. And we're all living in times where it's critical for us to accelerate our transition uh, contributions because we have to meet our 2030 goals. So I'm um, very happy to be a part of this uh, ecosystem where there is leadership, there is commitment, there are, uh, you know, there's a government which is committed. Um, you know, uh, I come from a family of bureaucrats and I can tell you that it wasn't on top of uh, a diplomat's agenda to be talking about uh, sustainability as much as we are seeing them do now. Uh, we experience that here in India where that uh, you know, the ambassadors here are prioritizing sustainability and ensuring that when they come back from uh, a climate week or COP, that there are follow-up sessions where we're being invited for discussions and to see how we can implement some of the uh, announcements which have been made, some of the partnerships we can enter. So it's really great to see that momentum and that's good. And so as uh, they say that, you know, some, we were, I was just discussing with Mr. Chakrabarti that, you know, some of this can lead to a lot of enthusiasm and some of this can lead to a little bit of greenwashing. Some say a lot of greenwashing. <laughs> I think it's the truth is somewhere in between and we have to be mindful of that. Um, and as a renewable energy player, I can say that one of the roadblocks I see is the lack of commitment of innovation around finance whether it is uh, financial institutions, whether it is multilateral um, uh, institutions. It's here, I would love to have a chat with uh, Nina, I think you mentioned, to see what is it that we can do. Because I do feel that uh, there should be a lot more focus on what we need to do for this sector in particular, not necessarily. I mean, we have to look at folks who are making the transition, uh, hard to abate, etc. But sometimes we get too focused on that. So that's my uh, one roadblock. We need more innovation and more acceleration with respect to engagement. Um, and then if I look at India itself, um, you know, ambition also, with ambition comes a lot of uh, ability to execute. And in a country like India where there are uh, so many people, uh, you know, and uh, such a vast country um, with infrastructure which requires a lot of attention, and the good news is that attention is being given to infrastructure, but then it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. So I think uh, that is important to be able to prioritize and accelerate the infrastructure build uh, so that uh, some of the green initiatives can be executed uh, more expeditiously. Um, you know, also regulations, perhaps some regulations around sustainability. So it's great to see that the investors have demanded and that's why if I could, and you know, you can show, raise of hands for those who disagree with me, but uh, if it wasn't uh, the ask of investors, I think a lot of us would not have been 
prioritizing sustainability as we are. Or if it was not the ask of regulators globally and uh, in countries as well, we wouldn't have been doing what we are doing as well. So it's n in business, nice to do is not that nice. So therefore, um, I think uh, in India, I would say that more regulations uh, would help us accelerate the ESG sustainability commitment as well. Um, you know, I can always come up with a longer list, but I'll pause here. If you could just elaborate a little more on the innovation in finance that you spoke of and what exactly uh, are, are you looking at or what exactly are you looking for? Are you looking at SOPs which should be made available, uh, improved, you know, pricing basis or uh, sustainability rating because that's something that's there already through sustainable link loans. Uh, so a little more if you could elaborate on that ask. Yeah, no, you know, I want to keep it a little bit bigger picture because, you know, I mean, I, I want to get into the micro details of structuring and, you know, you know, issuing and all of that and, uh, you know, that, that's for a separate conversation. I just feel that uh, the world banks, the European banks, the development banks, etc., really need to step up their commitment with respect to funding some of these activities in the uh, global south. I don't see that happening. I don't see product opportunities for companies like ours from these institutions, and there must be. So, um, so you know, these are things which I'm talking about. Bigger picture. Okay. Similarly, for financial institutions, of course, there are a couple of green bonds here and there, etc. But I think it's more tokenism right now. But it's really good to see, sir, to just be a little bit more positive, that uh, we are all moving in that direction, but we just need to double-click on how, how, how well we are doing this. Are we doing enough? Are we also encouraging folks who are actually responsible for the transition? I don't okay. think that's happening as okay. much. Well understood. Anab, did you want to add something? Just a small point here. If you look at the whole uh, acceleration of the sustainability journey, there are two aspects to it. One is the demand side, the other is the supply side. Usually when we talk about supply and sustainability, a lot of focus is on the supply side. But if you take a step back, roughly 50% of the contribution comes from the supply side. 50% contribution is from the demand side. End use industry. So probably a, a kind of a pointer for Mr. Sanjeev is, I mean, the work has to happen on both sides. It's very good to see in this year's budget that one of the seven subtrashies has been green. But then if we have to accelerate the journey, I think the entire value chain has to be looked into. And how do you incentivize the value chain in the right way? I think there is some more work in my view to be done on that. And it requires a deliberation. There's no easy answer. But looking at the entire value chain is both from both sides, from both demand as well as from the supply side. Okay. Understood. Okay, yes, so uh, vision, yes, commitment, yes, and uh, of course what you elaborated on uh, both Arnab and uh, Vaishali on, uh, on what needs to be done by some of these development agencies is very, very critical to accelerate the, the movement. Um, Sanjay, for you, uh, you know, taking from where Vaishali left off and knowing that technology is also uh, playing a pivotal role in the net zero uh, transition across sectors, uh, we understand Fortum is working on one of its kind, uh, one of its kind technology to build the world's first bio uh, refinery producing cellulosic ethanol and bio-based uh, chemicals from bamboo, uh, while producing green power as a byproduct uh, for local usage. Can you tell us more about this project? Um, yeah, you know, and what is it expected? How much of carbon uh, footprint is it expected to reduce? Uh, as well as a reduced dependency on uh, imported crude oil uh, and contributing to positive social impact for, for the country. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. So if, if I would, were to just sort of give a high-level picture that clearly, uh, from our company perspective, we feel that uh, in this sustainability journey, uh, solar is one part, electric vehicle is another, uh, we would come to a concept called as biofractionation. And when we talk about biofractionation, we clearly believe that biomass should not be burned to produce steam and electricity. Uh, they can be fractionated, and the various fractions are far more valuable than just uh, steam and power which comes out. Uh, so this is a plant which is, which is close to around a 4,000 crore plant which is coming up uh, in Numaligar. Uh, this would, uh, the, the feedstock is the bamboo which is predominantly available across the whole of Northeast. Uh, we would use close to around 500,000 tons of bamboo. Uh, we would process it, and this would produce close to around 60 million liters of uh, bioethanol every year, 
or you can say 50,000 tons of bioethanol. Uh, and if you see this arc of mobility in this, at least the government of India started off with 1% mixing of ethanol with petrol. We've already reached 10%, and in the next two years, it is expected to reach 20%. So that one part of bioethanol would go towards uh, mixing it with petrol. This plant would also produce furfural alcohol and uh, uh, acetic acid. And then these two products sort of are used in various industries like uh, chemicals, fragrances, uh, and other sort of industries. Uh, coming to financial part, I think clearly if this bioethanol is replacing 20% of uh, hydrocarbon, uh, so clearly close to around 75 million US dollars of foreign exchange is saved every year. Uh, typically, we would land up uh, close to around a lakh and 50,000 tons of CO2, which will get saved, uh, around 24 megawatts of power, which will get generated. Uh, from this process itself. So it's a zero emitting process. Everything which gets consumed gets, con gets sort of utilized within the plant. Uh, that's another part. Uh, the more important part is, in fact, the government of Assam also wants to invest in this project simply for the reason that close to around 12,000 to 15,000 farmers would get affected uh, in a positive way because they would be growing bamboo over there. So directly, we will impact close to around 30,000 families uh, which, who would uh, clearly, I've been told, OK, uh, close to around 25 to 40,000 rupees per bega per season. Uh, that would be the sort of extra money that they can make. So this is, a, this is a project in which it starts off from the basic level in a village, how the standard of living can be raised, how we can use a basic raw material which is so much abundant in the Northeast, and how we can convert it into some products which will find resonance with respect to mixing of petrol, and of course, across the world we can do. And this is something called as 2G as compared to the 1G ethanol, which is from, uh, which is from molasses or which is from corn. This 2G comes from bamboo or other kind of biomass that we talked about. Very interesting because you're ticking a lot of boxes with, uh, with this. So two questions, two follow-on questions. One, when are you expected to commission this? Uh, uh, this, th this would get commissioned towards the first quarter of next year. OK. Yeah. And second is, are you looking to replicate it in other yes, places of course. as well? Uh, I would say that uh, while, while you asked me about bioethanol, I would just try to give you a journey of sustainability. For example, if we start off with solar, uh, even somebody with a crystal ball would have never guessed 10 years back that where solar would be in 2023. In 2020, 2012, we were around 300 megawatts. Today, we are 60,000 megawatts. So the scales are crazy. The tariff was 18 rupees. Now the tariff is 2.5 rupees. So I would say in biofractionation, in bioethanol, we are where solar was in 2012. So still, we've got a long journey to go, but I think in clearly in the next eight to 10 years, uh, this would also become mainstream as solar has become mainstream now. Wishing you all the best for it. Thank you. Um, Sanjeev, um, a little less than a third of global greenhouse gas emissions is attributable to uh, the agricultural industry. We know this issue is close to your heart, and it's no surprise um, then that earlier this year, Yara Fertilizers in India became one of the first large European uh, companies to issue a sustainability report. Can you tell us some best practices that you're adopting to address this um, and to reduce the emissions from agriculture? Yeah, uh, thank you. That's an interesting question. And uh, what I would start by saying is that sustainability is at the heart of a business, just like you. Hopefully, Ashish will give me a low rate of interest from now onwards. I need to put it on the record here. Uh, when we look at Jara, I would say we're very, very, uh, as I said, it's at the heart of whatever we do. And since 2005, actually, we have been working at reducing our emissions, though the Paris Agreement came into force in 2015. And uh, since 2005, we brought down our emissions to about 50% lower. And I think by 2030, it should be down by another 30%. So when we go to the farmers, uh, that's where we work. That's agriculture for us. When you go to the farmers to offer our crop nutrition products or uh, offerings, we're already starting at a low carbon footprint. That's a starting point for us. 
we are an extremely farmer centric country a company in india and otherwise globally it's unusual for me to wear a suit frankly speaking i'm kind of uncomfortable but uh, nevertheless uh, for the occasion the fact is that uh, we are extremely farmer centric we work very closely with the farmers day in day out we have about 250 260 uh, sales economists out in the market uh, we engage with the farmers to <coughs> explain to them to demonstrate to them how to use crop nutrition water and also how to get the best out of their soil in a sustainable manner and uh, we connect with almost about a million farmers on a on an annual basis on a physical one to one but i think what's more important is that we need to keep bear in mind that india has 140 million farmers we are a nation of small holder farmers and we need to lift their farm productivity so that the new and ensure the nutrient use efficiency comes up and that will push down the carbon emissions so for that we have gone the digital route covid taught us we also pivoted and we went the digital route so we are connected digitally with uh, about 9 million farmers in india and that we intend to scale up to about 30 25 million farmers by the time we come to 2025 next 3 years time we are ready pushing the accelerator down to the metal and we also understand when we work in the markets that the farmers depend a lot on advice from the retailers 75% of the buying decision done by the farmers this is this so to ensure that the retailers give the right advice we have come out with an app called yara connect where we connect with almost 70000 retailers and on a, almost on a weekly or a biweekly basis we send out notifications advisories on a hyper local basis if you in a retailer in a corn market we will give you something about corn this is what you need, you need to tell your farmers you can share it via whatsapp so we want to connect with as much as 30000 retailers by the time we come to 2025 so that's to pass on the knowledge because there is a serious gap at the farm at the farmer level to close the knowledge gap for us as well as for the farmers then when we look at the value chain we cannot do it everything by ourselves if we really want to move towards a nature positive food future that's where it's important for the world to make sure that we get enough food for all all of us while we protect the planet Uh, we have to work in with the ecosystem players let's say we have we work with the acam with the seed with water management companies on the input side to make sure that there is proper utilization of the input resources and the output side we work with the food companies the key thing is that the farmers doesn't know what the consumer wants mm. the food company knows so that's why a la- large chunk of food is actually wasted because we don't want to consume it so when the f- we engage with the food companies we understand what the food companies need we work with the farmers to help them produce what the consumer wants and that increases farm productivity and also increases the marketable yield for the farmers which means more returns and better financial returns for the farmers that's what we do last but not the least what we also started to do is uh, we've seen that uh, we have the pleasure and honor of working with many female farmers in india india has about 10 million women farmers uh, and uh, we've seen that they what we have learned from them is that they nurture us they take care of the soil they take care of the plant and they really put the right stuff into the crop into the soil so they get excellent crop which is extremely nutritious we taking a stealing an idea from there and uh, what we decided that now we going to pivot and become a more diversified workforce that is as a sales agronomist out in the trenches out in the front line we are going to hire female agronomists who will work do the same job that sales agronomists are doing otherwise so we have already made some significant progress there like we moved from about 5% females out in the front line to about 15% in the span of one year and this is going to become 35% by the time we come to 2025 and that again i think is going to get really push the agenda of nurturing and sustainability out in the market and hopefully it will encourage our peer our peers in the industry to also follow and hire more females bring more diversity into the workforce we cannot change the world by ourselves but i think we are very very clear that as long as we work in an extremely collaborative manner along the value chain starting from seed to harvest to the marketplace we can move the world in the direction of a nature positive food future that's what we want to achieve okay that again is very very interesting uh, not something that i've heard of earlier so so very very good um, and of course the fact that you are encouraging women, not just women farmers which you are seeing the benefit of but also promoting them on the front line is uh, is very good to absolutely hear. thank you 
Uh, Arnab, um, the triple planetary crisis is a massive risk to profitability. Sorry, I'm asking you a lot of questions on profitability. Um, so sustainability is in the business's own interest, you know. I mean, I think more and more corporates are realizing that. Consumers are also increasingly making those choices. We just spoke about it because they are conscious of the choice that they are making. And no business wants to, um, no business that wants to stay afloat can, you know, just say that, forget about sustainability. Uh, Schneider Group has robust disclosures and a well-articulated ambition towards net zero with the well-defined targets. What are your views on ESG in context of business top line, um, procurement practices, value chain impact, and uh, how well is it being understood and contributed you know, across depart departments, not, not just sales or not just finance, but across departments? I think first, to answer your question on the overall business logic, how does it make sense, I'll give you some data points. Like we do a lot of energy efficient solution for our different customers. So three data points if I pick up and say for example in a building, a best in class energy efficient building is about 70% more efficient than a normal building. So you can work out the math how it works. A best in class steel plant is about 30% more efficient in power than a normal steel plant. And these are huge economics we are talking in behind. Similarly, if you look at a hotel industry, a best-in-class energy-efficient hotel will be about 50% more efficient than a normal hotel. What we need is more education. How do we spread the education? And it's a learning curve. We are in the journey. We, I mean, companies like us, we are spreading the awareness. But as I said, I mean, I mean more, more is needed, more education is needed. But if you really get into the brass tacks of doing a business model or an ROI, and the moment you accelerate your sustainability journey, you will see when I said in the beginning it's a good business, there is actually math behind the good business. So that's, that's one part of the discussion. What do we need to do? I think it's a holistic uh, uh, value chain which has to evolve. I think uh, from, the, from the supplier ecosystem side, from the, from the uh, whole distribution channel ecosystem side, I think everybody needs to contribute and partner in the journey. The government also has a role to play, to stitch everything together. But overall, if you ask me, I think, yes, I mean, awareness is much higher today. And uh, the regulation is helping. I mean, as you know, the SEVI has already mandated for top 1,000 countries to do the DRSR disclosure this year. Some of them had voluntarily adopted. Many of them in this March you will see coming in. Soon you will have a formal, informal rating system developing in the country. Companies will be compared with their competitors, and sustainability score will determine their ability to raise finance and other things. So the ecosystem is developing in this. Most of us, most of the European companies like us, we are a signatory to the Paris Convention or we signatory to various conventions. So we have our own global agenda to develop. So it's a combination of, I mean, the global guidelines, the, the regulation in India, the whole awareness, and the basics of the business dynamics. But what is also required along with the whole electrification or the whole digital journey is how do we use the data revolution well. As I said in the beginning, it's hand in hand. Digitization and decarbonization goes hand in hand. So the machines have to become more efficient, the, the assets which produce has to become more efficient, more digitized. We need to do more and more preventive maintenances by using more digital. So if you see Schneider, we promote a open IoT, something like an, which we call our ecostructure solution. It's a three-stage IoT. So basically what we say is everything which we sell has to be a connected device which communicates both ways. That's the layer one of the IoT solution. Layer two is you, you do an automation around the edge. So you uh, connect all the machines through an edge control solution so that the machines talk to each other. Layer three is where the app analytics layer comes in. Wherein you are using the data, you are, you are seeing the data pattern, predicting. The more you can predict, the more you can prevent. And this ecostructure uh, or this whole uh, the three layer solution is what leads to the ultimately the business economics. Many companies are moving in this journey, but it's a combination of learning from your data evolution and how do you implement it. That's where I think the business economics comes into. Yeah. And it's also a little bit of what Vaishali said earlier in terms of, you know, regulators are demanding it, uh, clients are demanding it. So, you know, you're getting to that level because there is an ask for it and the government is pushing for it as well. So it's, it's one is what the corporate is doing by itself and then there is this whole uh, ecosystem around it which is pushing it forward uh, towards it. And, and you'll be very happy to see, I, I do a lot of campus visits. Even the new age, if you look at the millennials, college, they, they, the colleges are demanding it. That they, they want to join a company which is sustainable. 
Right. And invariably, I get a question or two. If I go to, when I go to an IMs for a hiring and being an alumni, I do a lot of hirings from IM. So you get questions like this. Yeah, yeah. So the whole and awareness is coming in all direction. And they are the future. So it's great that they are already thinking about so it. It's moving it. in that direction. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's fa coming faster than we think. Correct. Vaishali, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, I mean, I just want to take, uh, stretch it outside the IMs. Uh, you know, at Renew, we see we have students coming from Europe and uh, the United States wanting to come and work for a, a renewable energy company in an emerging, uh, in developing uh, world. And uh, to go and experience what's happening in terms of environmental uh, progress, uh, engaging, social impact. So that part of it, and of course the finance strategy, innovation, and all of that. And there's a lot of learning actually from reverse mentoring for people yeah. uh, in our teams where they really learn a lot. Uh, and uh, you know, if I could go down to the, you know, it's the basics here, and this is what our uh, Honorable Prime Minister has been talking about as well, is the life mission. That uh, if we are, I think we've done a great job uh, visioning for the industry, for the country. And now we have to take it to people and get them engaged and own this journey. And uh, as this is a European uh, sort of conclave, um, you see that when, you know, from your childhood, it is, you know, sustainability, etc., is a way of life. Um, I think implementing it becomes easier. And uh, I think that is our uh, next journey. And so engaging the youth, the youth are demanding now. Yes for in everything, for everything, you know, academics, they don't care about how much they make, but they want to work for a clean and a green uh, platform. And um, yeah, so they want to be a part of this journey and they want to hold us responsible for how we hand this planet, very cliched, but I do speak as well to a lot of uh, children, including my own children, uh, and that's what I hear. True. Um, yeah. I, add, I mean, I kind of agree with that because these days, I think the next generation of the millennials, as we talk about, they are much more concerned about nature and the sustainability. We have a digital hub in Bangalore where we could hire from the IT sector uh, almost 120, 130 people, colleagues, in no time, just because they wanted to work with an organization which has the sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it was very fascinating for us because we knew in the digital space to get IT people very quick, overnight almost, to join us. It was a very humbling experience actually for us. Yeah. Okay, no, I, I just want to uh, circle back to your first question about policy framework. So I had uh, listed some uh, positive policy framework, but also there are some negative policy frameworks, uh, which I think is important to mention. I, I missed mentioning it before, and particularly in the EU, uh, European context. Uh, you see, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, will come into place. So Indian exporters or Indian uh, companies which are part of the value chain or the supply chain will get affected unless, you know, they, they uh, you know, come up with sustainable, uh, you know, mechanisms of, uh, of production. Then the German supply chain law is already in place. So companies which have 3,000 or more employees, they have to ensure that you know, their suppliers follow the norms of the German supply chain. So if we have companies in India which are supplying to Germany and they don't follow you know, their sustainability norms, then they can't export to Germany. Uh, EU is also coming up uh, with something called uh, uh, green shipping uh, mechanism where uh, they will not allow uh, uh, ships which don't meet their standards uh, to dock uh, in European ports. Most of the Indian fleet is, is, you know, aging and is not energy efficient. So our ships cannot carry our cargo and call on European ports. And this is going to happen very soon. So there is this external force which will work, which will force us to turn green. And I think the more we, uh, as Arnav was saying, education, and the more our companies and our corporates know these challenges. Because, you know, they may be very happy exporting to Germany. And one fine day they will realize that that number 3000 has gone down to the middle stand, the small uh, MSMEs who will be forced to uh, source uh, green. So I think uh, this negative pressure also will, will, will start appearing. Uh, and and, and uh, we have, of course, appealed against uh, the CBAM in WTO. Uh, but um, we have to see how. Uh, but my, my sense is that sooner or later they, the European Union will, will enforce it. 
and that will be difficult to do business so unless we ourselves turn green. Yeah, I think that's a really good point you mentioned. Um, uh, you know, we have to ensure that as we advance in this journey um, to meet our goals, that the world is collaborating and not becoming super competitive mm. and inward looking. So I think that balance, it's important to look inwards and to look at your country and to do, uh, prepare the country to be able to, you know, go out and partner and become competent as was just mentioned. But that fine balance and the fine line uh, with respect to some of these regulations we are seeing coming out of the US and Europe mm. need to be assessed for clarity and transparency and engagement and collaboration. I think that will help us reach our goals faster. Sorry. One final data point. I think yeah. if you look at from an Indian context, we are not yet at our peak of emission. We will be in our peak of emission in the 2030s. That's mm -hmm. what the research shows. Now, today, if you see the government's mission towards a net zero, we are aiming 2070. That is with the basic assumption that the existing installations will die its natural death. Now, we have published a research, which I'm carrying the book, which says that the 2070 can become 2047, provided we take an accelerated plan of decommissioning the installations. I think that's where, as a country, we need to get into a discussion that how do we decommission some of the installations faster so that, I mean, if we don't do anything in the normal course with the installations, 2035, 36, when we will pick. Now, that we can change if we start planning from now on, decommissioning some of the installations. And this is a collective journey, the industry, the government, everybody collectively has to take in this direction. There is a lot of investment required by 2030 for us to achieve what we want to achieve by 2070. And decommissioning, I, can, I guess, can start only once we, you know, are pretty sure in terms of where we are headed. I mean, that's, that's my view. I haven't read your publication, but... Yes, that's enough. Of course, of course. Totally agree. Um, Sanjay, the mobility uh, sector is playing a vital role in contributing towards decarbonization in the form of transitioning to new business models. This transition in the road mobility space is evolving at a faster pace than what one would have thought of a few years ago. What are the key challenges that you foresee in scaling the adaptation towards uh, cleaner mobility on the, uh, on the mobility space? And uh, what is your ask if any, from the ecosystem as a whole? Yeah, I think, I think uh, if you were to see from an e-mobility perspective, so there is a huge change which is happening. And just to give you an example, while we keep sort of talking about the percentage numbers, last year probably around 48,000 electric vehicles were sold in the country. Uh, Norway, which is considered to be a place where the maximum electric vehicles are sold, sold 1,32,000 vehicles last year. India would sell 1,38,000 electric vehicles this year. So what I'm trying to say is that we sometimes get sort of bogged down by what is the percentage of electric vehicle but uh, as a whole. But in 2023, the number of electric vehicles will be sold, which is equal to that in Norway, which is considered to be an example of electric vehicle all across the world. So, so clearly, there is a lot which is happening. Uh, from a policy perspective also, if I were to say uh, that the government has given great incentives, uh, I would say that this is the incentive which is the best in class in the whole of the world. Again, I come back to Norway. Norway had sort of waved off 25% VAT on electric vehicles. And in India, the GST is 5% as compared to all the other ICE vehicles, which is ranging from 25 to 40%. So clearly, from a, from a, from a policy push perspective, uh, uh, both from, I think, the adoption of electric vehicle, uh, as well as from the demand side and the supply side, I think necessary interventions have been put in place, although companies would still sort of hanker for more. Uh, but I think, uh, clearly, there are, there are uh, great initiatives in place. And in fact, going forward very recently, Another rule has come in where even if you consume 100 kilowatt of power for electric vehicle charging, you can still apply for an open access. So down to the last electric vehicle charging, you could also use green energy because uh, even 100 kilowatt, you can source it from open access if it is for those charging infra. So I think overall, the thing, the whole industry is ripe for this. Uh, 
uh, the vision statement of government of india talks about 10 million vehicles electric vehicles by 2030 uh, i think it's a vision statement uh, but clearly aiming for 30 percent of vehicles by 2030 of electric vehicles i think that's 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 a great uh, place to start off with and if i just sort of articulate one more thing that the concept of uh, power on wheels i think in the next 10 to 12 years would come on and if we have land up having 10 million vehicles electric vehicles and every electric vehicle has got close to around 30 kilowatt hour of battery we're talking of 300 gigawatt hours of power which is there uh, which can be which can be sort of uh, uh, exploited so i think nothing to ask from the government from a electric vehicle standpoint i think it's it's the responsibility of supply side and the demand side to make sure to exploit everything to meet the goal yeah, yeah. thank you Sanjeev, as um, a leading producer and trader of ammonia, Yara has uh, taken the lead in developing clean ammonia at scale to enable reduced emissions from uh, food production. Now, green ammonia, green hydrogen have become the buzzwords as we discussed earlier uh, and the renewable sec in the renewable sector space. And, um, you know, but as a producer of ammonia, how realistic and immediate do you see an opportunity in this space of green ammonia? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's correct. I think Yara has been the one of the first movers uh, when it comes to green ammonia. We have already, uh, let's say, uh, we are going to actually produce green ammonia based fertilizers sometime this year. Okay. It's already, we'll be one of the first uh, to actually put it on a ship. And uh, one thing I would also like to mention here is that we have also tied up with a couple of, uh, with two major food chain companies to supply green fertilizers to them in the coming years. So that is starting to roll out now. Uh, also, as a, at the global level, we have uh, a unit by the name of Yara Clean Ammonia, which looks into setting up of plants and tying up long-term arrangements for green ammonia. And when it comes to India, I would say uh, the future is here. <laughs> we are a land of sunshine and uh, water, uh, water, hydropower as well as wind power. So we have everything here. And also, we have a very strong domestic market, not only in the fertilizer sector, but also in the energy sector. And green ammonia is the place to be in. We are importing, as, uh, as a country, we're importing almost three and a half to four million tons of uh, ammonia for, to produce uh, fertilizers along the coastline. So that is a ready market available. And uh, so I think uh, the future is here. Yeah. It's really good. Interesting. Um, Vaishali, uh, this is the last question. I think we are already at 6 o'clock, uh, and we have still to open it out to the audience. Um, uh, European companies have been the clear leaders in adopting sustainable uh, practices across the length and breadth of their businesses. We've discussed about it uh, in the last one hour as well. Um, what can we learn from these companies in terms of uh, you know, accelerating the adoption uh, of sustainable practices within corporates in India? Sure. Uh, that's a good question. And, um, you know, I think the world we are living in, um, the boundaries are melting. I think Indian companies are leading uh, in a big way. Um, you know, we just got um, our definitive score, just to give an example, uh, which was uh, the highest in its sector, in its uh, category, um, globally. So um, I think um, we should basically derive confidence from our strategies, our unique strategies, our ability to be able to uh, deliver, and our ability to be able to sustain. Um, of course, uh, you know, there's a lot of learning in different areas. I think when I look at it, uh, there is an opportunity for R&D collaboration as we talk about the cost of electrolyzers, for, as an example, for green hydrogen, it's got to come down. Uh, if you look at storage, like battery storage, we conducted a study in partnership with Stanford to figure out how can we, for around the clock, you know, kind of, you know, use batteries. Um, but best batteries, would they work in India, given the temperatures, high temperatures we have? How do we sort of adjust uh, uh, for that? How do we manufacture, 
here in a green way. So those are the areas we can learn by partnering for R&D. I think there's a huge amount of opportunity there for us. For any sector, for it to be sustainable, you need an R&D-driven approach. So perhaps a little bit there, um, I think, around AI and technology, although a lot of Indians go in other parts of the world and uh, you know, rock that sector, I believe uh, um, you know, we, can, we can perhaps lend a learning uh, lens there to our European counterparts. So I think it's a mutual learning. There's much to be learned from us with respect to the scale at which we execute. I think no other country uh, can, uh, um, I mean, I'm sure there are some, but it's, it's quite a challenge to scale at the scale we do. Um, so a lot of learnings. Just one point, I think, of learning for us, that as we talk about numbers and quantum of uh, you know, uh, EVs, et cetera, we have to ensure we're talking about feeding in clean energy. And that's when it is perhaps uh, more comparable and aligned with the green sort of uh, uh, sentiment we're all working towards. As of now, I don't think that's the case. The um, electricity which is being fed in is quite dirty. And so maybe those are areas where we can focus on uh, not necessarily a learning, but something we should um, accelerate internally so that we can implement. So knowledge is fungible now. Yes. So we are all masters of our own region, and we need local expertise, uh, which is what we started this conversation with. Local expertise, local focus, but collaborating to be able to not do one plus one is two, but one and one is 11. So I guess that's, that's what we need to work towards today. Yeah, as you rightly said, the borders are melting. And you know, I mean, information is just a click away. So either you exchange ideas with someone by calling them or, or reading about it, everything is available. So it's both sides. Okay, um, I think we are at the end of the session. I was just told that there is no time for, uh, for Q&A, but uh, you know, we have them around uh, post the session in case anyone would want to interact or ask any questions later. So thank you very much to all of you. It was very nice hearing uh, from you. And I'd uh, request um, Sanjay Singh, our CEO, to just come back on stage for a quick group photo. Thanks. Whilst this uh, photo opportunity is happening, I'd just like to inform you that our next session is for only 15 minutes and it will be followed by high tea. Uh, and it's a very, very interesting presentation on uh, the private in investment for climate. So this is being done by the Green Climate Fund and I'd like you all to remain here for this session. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, may I request you to please settle down. We're going to start with this session. And this is by the Green Climate Fund, Private Investment for Climate. We have uh, Mr. Darren Karyama and Mr. Rajiv Mahajan from the Green Climate Fund. And we are going to have a presentation by them. I request all of you to remain seated.
I'd like to invite our uh, moderator for this session, Ms. Seema Arora, Deputy Director General, CII. Please join us on stage. And I request everyone to please settle down. Seema, I request you to take the session forward. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this very special session that we have this evening, which is really talking about a very, very important subject, which is climate finance. And I'm very honored to welcome today uh, Mr. Darren Karjama, Senior Strategy Relations Lead from the Green Climate Fund, and Mr. Rajiv Mahajan, who's, private sector, who's the head of the private sector facility of the Green Climate Fund. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, as you all know, uh, you know, this is the year that India is also hosting and has the G20 presidency. One of the key dis threads of discussion in the G20 is about climate, energy transition, and the need to provide the right kind of financing mechanisms for enabling most of the emerging economies to undertake this transition. I think one of the biggest, uh, I would say, uh, you know, issues that the world t today faces, which is climate change, if we have to really take real action on it, it's got to do with the energy transition and how we can fund this energy transition. I think uh, the green climate finance is not just something that we are looking for public money here to fund all this transition. Private sector also has a very big role to play in this in, and support the low carbon economy transition. Uh, and therefore, I think the role that an organization like the Green Climate Fund, I remember in Paris when this was really, you know, we were there as, as an Indian delegation. I personally was also there. I think GCF is a critical element of the historic Paris Agreement and is the world's leading climate fund. And it has the mandate to support the developing countries and the emerging economies realize their nationally determined contribution ambitions. And that is where the, is the key role of the Green Climate Fund. India itself has very, very ambitious targets, the renewable energy targets. We just launched the green hydrogen mission. We've had a very, very successful energy efficiency mission, but we also have much more to do in energy efficiency as well. We were at a session discussing circularity and the potential of bio, uh, you know, uh, economy in that uh, circularity. Again, a huge potential. Again, financial support required for this transition as well. So I think in this session, we would like to welcome our, uh, the representatives of the Green Climate Fund, and I would now like to request them to make a presentation. May I first invite Mr. Darren Karjama to please make the presentation. Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for your time. We are not where we need to be. I think all of us here are familiar with this chart. The science and the observed temperature rises are noting to us we're in a situation where we need to take urgent action. Everyone here is also probably familiar with this chart, which came from one of the IPCC reports recently. It illustrates the emissions pathway that we are currently on as business as usual in the yearly annual output of emissions. Um, with all of the commitments that have currently been made, if those are implemented, um, we're putting ourselves on a pathway for a, uh, an additional 3.5 degrees Celsius um, by 2050. What you can see in the lowest line here is the dramatic change in economic behavior that needs to take place this decade, and then again in the next decade, and then again in the last decade to 2050 to bring us to that net zero commitment. As mentioned, the Green Climate Fund was created under the UNFCCC to support developing countries in achieving their climate ambitions. Those climate ambitions can be articulated through the NDCs, 
but also through their own national climate strategies and other adaptation ambitions that they might have. GCF has already turned itself into the world's largest climate fund. And the reason we're here today is because under the B20 and under the G20 each year, the alignment of the priorities are very similar to what we're seeing under the UNFCCC. The economic activity and growth must become net zero aligned. And so for the, the last number of years, GCF has also been attending and engaging with the G20 and B20 to contribute towards those actions. Today, we are here, Rajiv and myself, to give you, to offer a very brief presentation on how the fund works because we want to engage with you. We want to hear your ideas, your project investments that are seeking innovative uh, or, or transformative investment from a fund like GCF to try to demonstrate that real paradigm shift is possible. To remind, many of you have probably worked with the GCF previously or you've at least heard of it, and the fund truly is unique. There are many things that are different from a normal MDB or DFI or other source of public finance. To remind you of some of those unique features, we have a, a very brief slide just illustrating that the fund itself is country driven. Our mandate is aligned and what we must deliver on is perfectly aligned with the commitments of each of the developing countries themselves. It's not to shareholders, it's not to a, a specific other strategy. We are an open partnership based organization. We already work with over 200 organizations to implement the projects that we invest into. We have a toolbox, which is a range of financing instruments, which is extremely flexible. Again, relative to other sources of public capital, we can truly start to invest going forward if we wanted to using only a single instrument. We could do 100% guarantees, 100% equity, 100% uh, grants or 100% loans. We have no concentration metrics in our portfolio or restrictions that we have to use. Our goal is to achieve impact and whatever instrument and whatever structure will achieve that under the right circumstances, we will deploy and custom tailor an investment solution towards that. Um, we also have a, a balanced allocation. What that means is 50% of the investments that the fund makes are into adaptation, climate adaptation projects. So that's helping to increase the climate resilience of economies and communities rather than just purely on mitigation, which is a, a very strong um, delivery that, that other funds are actually um, playing in that space as well. We also have very risk tolerant and patient capital. We can have very long tenure loans, very long tenure equity investments with extremely attractive rates much more attractive than what you'd be able to source from other sources of public finance which have a credit rating and, and raise funding from public markets. Where we focus, as I mentioned, we have a 50-50 split between adaptation and mitigation. To give you a sense of some of the areas, we call them focus areas that the, the fund actually invests into, we do, have, uh, we do have eight impact areas. The green being the uh, mitigation areas, the blue being the adaptation. I won't go into any detail on this because my colleague Rajiv is going to walk you through some of the some case studies uh, to illustrate this point much deeper. As mentioned, GCF was created as an idea back in 2010. We only became first operational in 2015. We approved our first investments just before the COP21 in Paris. Since then, we've managed to approve investments of $11.4 billion of our own funding, and that has mobilized additional co-investment to build a portfolio of $42.7 billion globally. So to answer your question, which I'm sure all of you are thinking, how can you work with us? Two ways. The first is that the fund issues up to $1 million worth of grants to developing countries per year to build capacity. Initially, these grants were dedicated towards government agencies to help them build national strategies and engage with climate finance funds. But we've since broadened the mandate of our grants to support even private sector agencies who want to improve their access to climate finance. All of these investments need to be uh, approved by the national government. Um, but we have many examples where th these specific uh, capacity development grants have gone to many different actors outside of government agencies. 
The second, which is easily the most famous of what, J, uh, what GCF is known for, is the 209 projects that we have invested into to date. And actually, we have a board meeting coming up uh, in a week and a half's time where we'll be approving another five to 10. The transformative projects that we, can in, uh, that we invest into, there are three modalities that you can use to engage with the fund. The first is you, your agency, your private sector company can go through a process to access the fund directly. It's not a fast process, it does take some time, but if you stick with it, you can become what we call accredited. And that means you can propose directly to the fund an investment proposal, and then you can uh, take that funding and actually administer it over the full life cycle of the project. The second modality, which is easily the most common, it represents over two thirds of the investments of the funds to date, is a company or an agency will work together with one of the agencies which is accredited to the fund. So we call those executing entities. There's a lot of jargon with GCF. But by engaging, we can play a matchmaker role to help you find a partner that fits best to engage directly with the fund to secure that, that investment from us. The last uh, modality, which is something we're only just piloting at the moment, is something called project-specific accreditation, where an individual project can be brought to us once. Not something that I would be banking on at the moment, but we are exploring this in the, the next couple of years. It's possible that in India we would have one. Oh. Oh. So how have we done so far in India? In India, we've approved three uh, of the capacity development grants with a total of $1.6 million since 2015. But more importantly, seven projects have been approved, five of which have been directly from the private sector. Those seven projects represent a total investment of over $3 billion to date. India is the single largest recipient of investment by the Green Climate Fund. From our portfolio, it was GCF investing $527 million, but because so many of the projects have a private sector component to them and private sector partners that are crowded in, we've managed to mobilize over $2.5 billion from additional capital into those Indian projects. I also know from this morning's presentations that we had many Europeans in the audience. I wanted to say thank you. Europe represents over three quarters, or almost three quarters, of the investments, the contributions we call them, into the fund to date since 2015. As I mentioned, the reason why we're here is because many of the priorities of the B20 this year, last year, the previous year, and next year as well, will be aligned with the GCF's uh, mandate. What we see huge opportunities in, in India today are in the hard to abate industries, in, in the energy transition, and there are a couple of the task forces that we're supporting, as well as some of the Sherpa tracks and the finance track that GCF is, is supporting. With that, I'll turn over to my colleague, Rajiv, and he'll walk you through a rapid-fire presentation of case studies and examples that will help illustrate what it is that we're talking about, what a GCF project looks like. And after this, we'll be moving to another room to have some refreshments, and we want to hear from you. So over to you, Rajiv. Thanks a lot, Darren. And I must say, um, the investments that I'm going to be talking about are investments that we are incredibly proud of. These are investments that we've developed ground up and brought them to this point that we could present them to you. Um, so this represents a footprint of the GCF's private sector interventions around the world. Um, we've done 45 projects, nearly $4 billion. Um, and wide, uh, widely spread across the world, across sectors, um, and, and our footprint is only going to increase with the, with the passage of time. Um, and this is what we've done in the last four years or so. Um, so the scale of our investments has significantly increased, as you can see. Um, we've kind of gone deeper into engagement with uh, our partner countries and, and gotten projects from them that, that you can see uh, in terms of the eight proposals that we've taken in from countries developed by the countries. We've also turned our focus to adaptation and into cross-cutting areas of climate as well. Um, here I'm going to talk about the unique challenges and the philosophy with which um, the GCF private sector looks at investments. So essentially what we are talking about over here is uh, barriers that 
private sector investors see in climate investments translate into risk factors and, and risk, elevated risk perceptions and those translate into a high cost of capital that deters private sector investors from coming in. Uh, the GCF is a unique blended finance in institution which has a, a broad toolkit at our disposal that we can deploy that Darren talked about. So besides instruments, we've got three levers of concessionality that we deploy in our investments and you'll see this in the case studies that I'm going to go through. Those three levers are uh, pricing, uh, so we can provide concessional pricing, we can provide structural subordination, and we can provide longer tenors much more than what the commercial finance uh, uh, players can provide in, in developing economies. And we use a combination of these three to develop a structure that works for um, the developers as well as for the financial markets and use this to catalyze private sector invest investments into the projects that we feel are impactful. Um, so getting into the case studies, I'm going to be very quick on these. Um, one of the earliest investments that I led in the GCF was opening up the renewable energy sector in Egypt. Um, Egypt had a failed history of doing it. We came in, we got it done with a $150 million envelope. Uh, we opened up the sector in Egypt. We brought down the tariffs from eight and a half cents to two and a half cents. And today, um, Egypt is an attractive destination for renewables. Um, the next one is, is another uh, unique idea that we worked on and, and we continue to hold in our portfolio. It's called Climate Investor One. It's a private equity fund which has two sleeves, one of which focuses on developmental capital, which is scarce in developing economies. And the other one is the high risk initial construction stage. GCF is present in both of those. And with our presence, we've gotten a number of projects over from the developmental stage into the construction stage. And in the construction stage, uh, given that we have uh, a subordinated uh, tranche, we are able to catalyze private sector investors. Um, our borrow fund, um, we all talk about the need for forestry. But here we are talking about the business of forestry. Uh, and we are creating an incentive amongst communities to um, protect carbon sinks. At the same time, um, kind of uh, develop avenues for sustainable timber. And uh, this, this uh, is structured as a private equity fund, fully invested in and operates across all the countries that you see, uh, closed. and. Um, the projects are now generating the impacts that we, that we had envisaged. Um, now this one is another project which is dear to my heart. Um, this is something we developed ground up for decarbonization of the industrial sector in Eastern Europe, the CIS, North, America, North Africa, the Balkans and the Middle East. Um, a lot of industries over here, um, the heavy industries are vintage, uh, 40, 50 years old and are not quite efficient. And to get them to a stage where they would be ultra modern and absolutely efficient would require process disruptions. Uh, we are encouraging those investments through a unique financial structure whereby we, pro we, we provide a, a results-based concessionality along with a concessionality for corporate governance targets in climate sustainability. Um, the leveraging energy excess finance uh, framework is a unique framework that we've developed for Africa. Um, the idea over here is that the decentralized sector, while it is quite lucrative, needs stable local currency financing in those markets to insulate them from macroeconomic risks. And by doing so, we will make the sector a lot more stable, attract a lot, lot of local capital into that sector. And, and that would make that sector a lot more viable going forward into the future. Um, this, this idea is being rolled out in Africa, and we expect the first transaction to be done within 2023. Um, the next one is, is a unique idea that focuses on climate resilient uh, agriculture in uh, Tanzania. And the idea over here is that we would be uh, providing a line of credit to a local bank um, to help incentivize the farmers to adopt um, climate resilient agricultural practices. And the unique element in this idea is 
climate uh, insurance which is being provided to smallholder farmers. Um, now this is another one which is quite a unique um, idea that we've, uh, we've approved and, and, and is currently under operation. It's called the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. Um, this is a sector which historically has not attracted private sector capital. And here we are focusing on developing private sector business models to address the degradation drivers of coral reefs. Um, this is structured as a private equity fund, and they always say that you know it's very difficult to get private sector investments in small island states. We are doing that over here. Um, this is an idea that I had developed ground up over a period of three and a half years. Um, and uh, this basically rides on the Indian government's ambitions to develop um, an ecosystem around electric mobility in the country. Uh, the challenge that we thought was, uh, number one, electric vehicles are double the price of conventional vehicles, and secondly, they have half the life. Uh, and therefore, that doesn't make for good economics. Um, so could there be a way in which we could bring um, the, the operating cost of electric vehicles at par with conventional vehicles? And to do so, we are setting up a new um, financing platform in India in partnership with Macquarie. Um, we are contributing $200 million over here, and the idea is that this platform will provide leasing and financing solutions to fleet owners of electric vehicles and bring down their operating costs down to the level of conventional vehicles, thereby bringing them to a point of indifference, uh, and, and, and they would then become the early adopters of electric vehicles. Um, this platform is, is uh, expected to take off uh, later this year. Uh, we expect to be signing financing documents uh, within a month and a half and uh, licensing by RBI uh, during the current year after which the platform will start operations. Um, climate Investor 2. It's modeled on the lines of Climate Investor 1 that I talked about, but here the focus is on, on the water sector. Uh, which is a sector which has historically not seen any private sector investor, in investments across the developing world. We are attempting to do the same that we had done in Climate Investor 1, provide developmental capital, and then provide the initial construction finance in the high-risk stage uh, to get water projects going. Um, and uh, this is the first water project that we have done at scale and, and of this size in our, in our uh, portfolio. Um, the Green Guarantee Company is another unique idea where we are attempting to set up a new institution, seed a new institution uh, that would enable um, the de-risking of uh, green bonds through capital markets. Uh, so we would provide a de-risking um, uh, structure that would enable country, uh, companies to raise green bonds in, in the financial markets. This is expected to take off within a year's time. Um, now, this is uh, another idea that we've, uh, we've recently uh, approved. Um, uh, the idea is that uh, climate, um, the climate challenge can only be met with new ideas, development of new technologies. And therefore, we've got to be supporting incubators and accelerators to do so. So we are setting up uh, two uh, accelerators, in, one in uh, Mexico and the other in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and, and these accelerators will uh, incubate new uh, climate technologies and, and would uh, attempt to get venture capital funding uh, for these technologies. Um, now, this is a snapshot of what we have done so far, um, and I would be very happy to answer any questions that you have about your ideas or about what we can do to work with, uh, with you and, and, uh, and get your ideas to life. Uh, with that, I hand over to Darren. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, if we do plain vanilla, we're not going to make it. We're not going to hit those ambitious targets. This year, India is taking the G20 presidency and being extremely ambitious with its goals and raising its ambition around climate. GCF wants to help be part of that solution. If you have a great idea that is truly transformative and is paradigm shifting, we want to hear from you over a sandwich. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll, in, we'll answer all of your questions. We're going to be hosting a, uh, a high tea, which is actually taking place 
two doors back, so out this door, then right back in, and at the back, I think everyone's been there for coffee earlier. Uh, Rajiv and myself will be there to answer any further questions that you have and to start those conversations. Thank you very much.